This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. It's a breezy, shimmery, party-filled atmosphere as we celebrate the birth of Scotty Too Hotty. This is Safari Live. I am in the middle of one of the true wilderness areas left in the world. This is the most mind-blowing wildlife experience you could ever hope to have. You are alive, you are alive. Good afternoon, good afternoon and welcome to our beautiful summer's day here in Juma Game Reserve. As you can see I'm wearing a ridiculous hat and that's because it's party time for Scotty D whose birthday it is today. Now my name is Tristan and on camera today I've got Senzo, hello Senzo. Senzo is also getting involved in the birthday spirit and I will show you what he looks like a little bit later. But remember this is live, it is interactive so if you want to join in the festivities of the birthdays and all kinds of other things that are going on this afternoon remember hashtag safari live on twitter or youtube chat if you would like to do so right now the plan for this afternoon other than looking like a completely ridiculous human driving around in a sparkly blue hat with little red ribbons flowing off of it and trying not to get laughed at is to hopefully find some animals hopefully they will also appreciate my hat and will be out in full force so what we're going to do is we're going to do our time lapses quickly just to get those out of the way so that'll be down towards treehouse dam and then from there i'm going to just take it as it comes and i'll probably end up going on towards chitwa this afternoon we also will have Noel out and about for her first afternoon drive so be nice to her and ask lots of questions and then hopefully the Mara will join us a little bit later. I know they're being rained upon right now and no one likes a rain on the birthday parade so hopefully that will all clear up and soon we'll have Scotty and Taylor out in their fancy hats too. I hope they join the party because otherwise I'm going to look ridiculous all on my own with a fancy hat. Right, Senzo, should we get going and go and do all these things that we need to do? I think so. I feel like we need to just quickly get these time lapses out the way so we can have a bit of a party after that and have a good time. But Senzo is going to get out shortly and we're going to show you exactly how Senzo is dressed today. He's once again going with safari chic but a touch of um, sparkly jewels I think today is the best way to put it. So we'll definitely have to show you exactly how he looks fairly shortly. He did a little model show for us just now and I'll show you the photos from that little model shoot or photo should I say. There's one that captures the essence of Senzo absolutely perfectly and so we'll get that just now. Now I think this hat actually funny enough now that I think about it has been used many a time. I believe that Sam once wore it back in the day and I think James has worn it once and now I'm wearing it. Everybody to tell me what to wear at the moment. I've had a week of being laughed at and well I think it's going to continue today as we drive around in this hat. I promise to try and keep it on for as long as possible but I do feel like I might have to just mix it up. I feel like I might have to create a bit of suspense and have different hats on today. Who knows maybe I will maybe I won't but the blue hat is definitely going to be here to stay for the first little bit of this drive. Right Senzo I'm going to position us so that we can see your Thanks Megs. Megs says I look great and Megs is the, you know, she's the real one that we need to kind of impress because Megan, some of you may not know this, but Megan is actually a superstar. She really is probably the most famous out of all of us here. She's in a music video that has over 4 million views and Megan is in that music video and so she's very famous, far more famous than I'll ever be. But anyway, it's okay, I'll just deal with it. And so if I get advice from Megan, well then I'm on the right track and if she says I look good, well then there we go, Megs. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Now you'll see Senzo over there. Senzo is rocking, like I say, safari chic once again. He's got khaki shirt, khaki pants, nice long socks, completed by the leather felt skin, which is an absolute safari must when you're out here. And to top that all off, we've got a bit of a color in the belt. You see there's some Maasai colors coming through. His little Kenyan expedition. You've got to add a bit of touch of Kenya to our show to mix it up. And on top then, he's wearing his jeweled crown, which is the crown of the king. And king Senzo is the king of fashion. And so that's him looking as dapper as dapper could be on this afternoon of celebrations. So Senzo, I think you're looking wonderful. I think you need to give everyone a thumbs up. There we go. Well done. Thanks, buddy. You're looking very good today. There we go. So Senzo, I think, is feeling as though he does look good as well. Right. Let's carry on and see if we can get to Treehouse Dam without 
laughing too much at ourselves. The thing is, uh, is that this afternoon and uh, while we kind of trying to move around, it seems as though there might be a few technical glitches with some of the other vehicles. So you might be with me for a little while longer, which I hope you don't mind. And I hope Scotty will get out today because I feel like sending Scotty a couple videos and photos and various other things to him as he drives along just so that he can be in the party mood with us and I really do hope that him and Taylor have got hats on I I issued the challenge today because Scotty said he wanted a party hat and he said he wanted to have a beer party hat now of course we couldn't make him one and send it to Kenya so I was hoping that maybe somebody decided that side to do it for him and knowing Taylor well she never shies away from a challenge to get dressed up and so I'm hoping she also has a hat of her own this afternoon but barring all of those kind of things, I think we're going to have a, a fairly slow start to our afternoon. It was very, very quiet this morning and we didn't see too much, but I think it'll be a little bit of a slow start given how warm it is. It is extremely hot again. There is not a single cloud in the sky. It's amazing how every morning we're waking up with overcast conditions, fairly cool, and by the afternoon it's blazing and clear and, and very kind of warm. So. I think most of the animals will be in some sort of shade area, some sort of um, thicket, just trying to stay out of the sun for a bit. You can always tell that that's the case when you come onto quarantine and there's no animals on quarantine. You know then it's been quite warm. And so I would imagine if we just check around the shady sections, watery sections, we might get lucky with some of the herbivorous animals and then later in the day hopefully some of the spotted cats are out and about because we know our naughty tawny cats have ditched us for quite some time. Interestingly enough though, I did get a little rumor today and, and it can only be a rumor at this stage. I don't know for sure, so don't quote me on this and don't think that it is an absolute, but apparently it sounds like one of the Nkuma females and new has also given cub, uh, birth to cubs on elephant plains. Now the only Nkuma female that could possibly be giving birth would be Amber Eyes, so I wait with bated breath for confirmation of this, but they said to me this morning that there are two females lactating in that pride, not just one, and so I'm interested to see who the other one is and what's going on. One of the guys I spoke to said he's going to go and investigate this afternoon. He didn't see them this morning, but he's going to go investigate this afternoon and try and give me confirmation on that but if that is true then that's absolutely exciting news and let's hope that the Nkuma Pride comes back to this area and shows us the new additions to the Pride. It would be wonderful to have them back on this side of the world. It maybe is why they're spending so much time that side of the boundary and, and hopefully eventually it will bring them back here. Other than that, news on all the other animals that we have out and about. Apparently Gajima was in Arethusa again last night, causing a bit of trouble with Ingrid Dam's young female. And they were having a little kind of fight, a scrap over a carcass. Of course Gajima won that battle very, very quickly because, well, male versus female is never going to really work. So he managed to get off with that. Um, Shadow and Cub obviously on Little Gari. Hosanna is close to Chitwa boundary, Little Gari, so hopefully he's going to cross over towards Chitwa. No updates for Tamba or Tandi or any of those, so hopefully this afternoon will bring a lot more um, exciting things and a lot more out and about than what we had this morning. Right, it seems as though technical glitches have been shifted aside, gremlins have been booted, and Noelle is ready to make her first appearance and to say hello to all of you as a fully fledged crew. So without further ado, let's go over to her so she can say hello to everyone. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this beautiful, warm, slightly windy day in Juma in the northern sands in South Africa. I am Noelle. You can follow us on hashtag Safari Live or on YouTube chat. It's my very first official drive with everybody. So thank you for all the warm wishes I received on my Instagram feed. It made me smile, made me super happy. And on camera, I have Jean-Dre. Hello, Jean-Dre. Hello, hello. Back from the Mara and some leave. Happy to be out here. So we're busy sitting at the the hyena den this morning, as you guys know. Um, it was super cold and a little bit quiet. So I was crossing fingers, crossing thumbs, holding thumbs rather, crossing toes. That maybe just maybe they might pop out and show their cute little faces. But unfortunately, it's just a bit warm. It's about 30 degrees Celsius, so about 80, 85 uh, Fahrenheit. So I think what we're going to do is rather head off to one of the watering holes and see if we can find anything coming for a drink or maybe some bird activity along the way. All right. So, ooh, there's your Noel moment for the day.
join us for always and also in August. All right, we're going to head over to Tristan. So it seems as a few gremlins are still lurking about, but that's okay, we'll sort those out and Noah will be out and about all over the place. But I'm sure she's super excited to be out here. I know she's gone up towards the hyena den. Hopefully it will be active a little bit later. I think she wants to go and check back there later and hopefully she has a wonderful start to her safari live career. I'm looking forward to spending time with Noelle. Of course I know Noelle. I've worked with her at Chitwa before so Ch she came and helped us out and freelance for a while there and we got along very well and it's kind of like old times being back in this area again so hopefully she will have a wonderful time with us and, and she'll grow and enjoy to love all of it. Oh, hello little Kudu. I was so busy talking about other things that I didn't even notice you. I'm sorry. Let me come back and appreciate you because you're in the shade and you are also wearing your best party hat. And that is the best party hat a Kudu could ever want and that is the form of an Oxpecker. Oh no, the Oxpecker flew away. There was a perfect party hat. It was sitting right in between its ears but the Oxpeckers have now moved and they along the side of the body and down the back and all over and in fact this Kudu is absolutely covered in oxpeckers. I wonder if they are feeding off the mange mites because this kudu does have mange. If you look on its neck area where these oxpeckers are actually sitting, there is a bit of mange that is formed on that area. And so I wonder if they do feed off mange mites. I've actually never read of oxpeckers feeding off that. I know they feed off parasites and ticks and various other things, but honestly I'm not sure if they do feed off the mange mites themselves. I'll have to just try and research that and maybe some of you might know. Shame that Kudu in the background is actually one that's way more affected than this individual, the one that's crossing the road there. She's got some lots of scarring from mange and that will go away now that we're in the summer months. You're going to find as the sort of rain comes and, and washes their coats clean and they'll be able to groom it all out and the population of mites will decrease manges very prevalent in this in the winter months and particularly dry winters remember that even though we're going into summer and spring now and there are green shoots to the leaves a lot of these animals are still suffering it's still dry 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 there's not a lot of moisture content around and even the trees that have sprouted leaves and the grass that has grown is slowly but surely dying due to the fact that it's so hot at the moment in the afternoons and so little rain has fallen so it's not ideal for these guys but they will be fine the body condition of that particular kudu is very good so there's no need to worry about it just yet the thing about mites and and well mange mites is that they do dehydrate these animals quite heavily and so as long as they can find water they should be okay they're just gonna have to spend a lot more time at water drinking all the time and so maybe that's why they're close to treehouse dam i've seen this particular kudu here for the last week just hanging around this area Kathy, you're asking if birds groom each other. Now, I've never seen the oxpeckers physically groom one another. Um, I would imagine that the chicks get groomed by the adults when they're younger and still in the nest. On the animal itself, no, you'll find that they don't groom one another. They're very good at grooming or preening themselves. Preening is probably a better word to use for the grooming process of a bird. But they tend to look after themselves fairly well and, and they don't actually groom each other. It's only if it's a mother or father grooming the little chicks, you'll find that they probably look after them a little Little bit and nestle down and just make sure that they're nice and clean and free of mites and various other things before they learn how to do it it's a fairly quick process though little chicks a lot of these chicks i mean they're fledging in in you know 15 20 days um, of the smaller birds and so they learn the technique fairly quickly right but i think those kudus have got the best idea is to try and get into some sort of shade because it is stiflingly hot in the sun i feel like i am being melted like a little candle and so we don't want to be melted like a candle on party day. We want to be able to be a bright, burning, shiny candle. So let's try and carry on driving or find some sort of shade to discuss all of these things. Now I see the tracks for Shadow and Cub from last night are in this little area as well. They do go down towards Treehouse Dam, we know, and then down south and into Little Gari itself, which is a bit of a pity. I was hoping that we were going to find them at Treehouse Dam this morning and that they were going to end up resting there and then trying to kind of take it easy for the day and then only cross over tonight, but that's the way it goes and we can't really complain too much. Shadow was here for about two days, we just only managed to find her yesterday morning. so. It, hopefully she'll she'll come back and seems as though she is spending a lot of time in this area what's interesting me very much is that i used to see when i was at simambili we used to see tandi frequently in the mulawati to the um 
south of Twin Dam, so from Baboon Pan southwards towards Little Gari Camp and then from there. Now she seems as though a shadow has moved in there completely and, and pushed um, Tundi out of that section which is quite strange to me. I would have thought Tundi would be trying to keep that area for herself. Maybe she realizes with all these young males around in the form of Tamba and Hosanna that it's maybe better to push further north and leave that. Shadow can look after that and try and kind of keep her little daughter alive in that area and she'll try and push up into this northern section where it's a little quieter and she can move around a lot less, well, undercover basically, a lot more undercover than if she's down in the south there. We know Hosanna. Oh my goodness, it's going to snow. <laughs> there are like 50 elephants next to me. That's amazing. <laughs> That's so cool. I haven't seen elephants in so long. Now I know I get super excited, but there's so many Ellie's here, which is so cool. I've missed elephants a lot. And so this is a sight for sore eyes. Hello guys, where have you all been? Hopefully you like my hat and don't run away. Oh no, my hat is getting hit off by trees. No, they don't really want me to come much closer, so I'm just going to stay here. But this is exciting to see. I didn't expect to see that many elephants as I was driving down the road. I just saw the road now and I thought, well, there looks like a few elephant tracks there. I wonder if these are any good. I was going to check a little bit further down, but there you can see a whole grouping of elephants all together. Now, they are look as though they're quite hot. A lot of them are sitting dead still. Their ears are, are out a little bit, trying to catch whatever breeze there is. I think they'll settle down. I think there's an initial shock of us kind of finding them and just going off road a little bit so they were all kind of stopped and looked in my direction but everybody's starting to relax now and feed and I see a few more of them right up on the top of the crest and they sort of kind of spread across this area it's not 50 elephants as I first thought there's a little bit less than that but I was excited so it's the way it goes but very cool to see these guys I don't know where they've come from and why they're here but at least we do have them so i'm certainly going to spend a vast majority of my time with these guys this afternoon if they will allow me now while i sit here and enjoy the beauty of some elephants on juma for the first time in a long time the birthday boy is out and about i hope he's wearing a fancy hat but he does want to say hello to all of you and he's got something that might fly away so let's quickly jump across to him Hello everyone, and exciting stuff with that large herd of elephants. It's a cold, wet and windy afternoon here in the Maasai Mara. We've just got a deluge of rain. As you can see, we're all covered up. We've just been sniping out of the one window. The rain isn't too hard at the moment. There's still a very slight pits of patter, but there is a lot of rain in the area. So I'm guessing we're going to have an interesting afternoon. On top of that, trying to get into position... vehicle at an angle like this to be able to get a shot of that bird up in the tree and in so doing thankfully a bystander saw it fall out and told us as i would have driven off unbeknownst so i'm gonna have to hop out and what the solution is and whether i can continue drive gently without that coil spring you can see this black-chested snake eagle is a little bit wet and you've got an idea of the weather we are experiencing here. Now, I must apologize, we didn't really come to the party with the party hats, but well done to Tristan and Senzo. I'm looking forward to seeing their outfits and I'm also looking forward to some pizzas later this evening. That's the plan for us. We're going to have a pizza party. There's a very nice pizza oven that we get to use that the Angama camp kindly lend us when they're not using it. Well, let us use their little bush dinner sites. Hmm. Well, good news is at least you've got Tristan, Taylor and Noel. And very excited for Noel and her prospects with our team it sounds like she has a wealth of knowledge and i'm sure all of you are looking forward to getting a new style of guiding each guide has their own little way about doing things so a very warm welcome to her and we wish her all the best on her first official drive oh goodbye perfect timing because as that bird headed off it sounded like tristan wanted you to jump back on his vehicle with that large herd of elephants 
Well, we do still have our Ellie's. They're a little on the shy side, so they keep moving off a little bit. I tried to just reposition so we had some sort of shade, and they didn't really like my repositioning and moved off a little bit. So I'm just going to stay where I am now. I didn't even manage to get to the shade itself. I just stopped as soon as they started moving, just so that they would settle down and start feeding and kind of get a bit more relaxed again. But it's so nice to see them on the property again and see little babies. I'm sure it's just that they are not used to the vehicles and, and maybe it's also hot and it's it's uncomfortable but you can see all of a sudden there's been some sort of communication and everybody's up and moving incredibly fast so they're not hanging around for anybody that's for sure which is a shame I was hoping that they would be far more relaxed in this and we could just spend the afternoon with them as they kind of fed their way along but they seem as though they're a little on the shy side and I don't want to pressurize them at all so we're gonna keep our distance and just try and see if we can just find a way that we can stand quite far off from them and still watch them nicely as they go along feeding. I'm surprised they're moving as much as they are. It's, it's hot and I would imagine that they would rather be in shade than right out in the open. Of course, elephants are supremely well designed you know, to handle the heat with that ear that almost acts like a radiating system and is able to flap and cause the blood to <laughs> basically get cooler. But it also, I suppose, sometimes they get a little bit on the grumpy side in the heat and they move. Now, I believe there's a herd of Ellie's at the Juma camp, so maybe Noel, who's that side of the world, can head there because I'm right down in the south at the moment, so it would take me quite a while to get there, and maybe if Noel's on that side, ah, Noel's going to Buffelsuk Dam. Okay, well, maybe when she's finished there, she can head that way. It just goes to show you, from no elephants, now we've got a whole bunch of herds all at once. It was only a matter of time in heat like this that Ellie's were going to come back to an area where there is water. Now, oh, I don't really want to push too hard, but let's try and just catch up a little bit with them. They are quite far now. I'm hoping that if we just get into a place where we can still see them and we can settle. I see there's another herd to my right here, another whole grouping on my right hand side. Whether or not these guys are going to come to the ones on the right, I'm not quite sure, but let's have a look. They seem as though they're changing direction and starting to move more towards this herd that's on the right hand side. So maybe if we can go to the right hand side ones, settle with them, these groupings will start coming and coming back this way. What I'm going to do though is because they're a little nervous, the shininess of my hat, and as much as I like to wear a hat and we like to have a lot of fun, this is probably not the best thing for what we're doing right now. Now, Ellie's notice things like this, so I'm just gonna put that off while we're with the Ellie's. I'll put it back on a bit later, but while we're with the Ellie's themselves, I don't wanna cause any unnecessary sort of distraction to them. You can see a whole bunch of them still moving on my right hand side, so they are slowly kind of moving away from me. It's not ideal where we are either. It's very thick and dense in here, which means that I'm hitting a lot of trees and branches, and that's causing a bit of sort of noise to, to start, and that's why they're moving away. But there's the rest of the herd. There seems to be about nine or 10 over there, and then about another 12 or so to my left-hand side. So it's, you know, fairly good size herd, average size herd for our area. They definitely are a welcome sight though. I'm, like I say, super excited to see them. It, one of the biggest things that we've missed over the last few weeks has been these guys. I love spending time with elephants, particularly here on Juma, because generally they are very relaxed and we do get these intimate experiences where elephants are often all around the car and, you know, it, it really just is wonderful to watch their social nuances as they move around and they interact with one another. The family and the tight-knit unit that they form is always fascinating to watch and to observe and so I really hope that these guys do spend a bit of time and relax with us so that we can stay here a little longer. Dos Santos um, elephant herds won't fight too much unless we get a situation where it gets dire for water and things like that. Then you'll find they'll compete quite a lot around the water sources and they'll push each other and kind of move each other off. But generally, no, they're not too stressed about one another. In fact, you'll often find a lot of communication will take place and they'll come towards one another, investigate. There'll be lots of rumbling, lots of calling, and then everyone will either go their separate ways or they sometimes even join together for a few days if conditions are right and there is a food source that is available and water that is available then you'll find you can actually see look at that elephant's no a trunk up in the air 
it's sniffing so i think it's picking up that there's a herd here that is south of us maybe these are two different groupings and they're now bumping into one another but she's definitely picking up a smell you see that and she's by analyzing what is that scent that i'm picking up now the distance that they are at they'll be able to communicate with low frequency sound much lower frequencies than we can hear so they might be talking to each other it also could be that they're picking up the scent of us and of rusty rusty does have a little bit of a fuel smell to him at the moment or her should we say and so they might be picking up that fuel scent it could be why they're kind of just smelling around but i think it's more because they've picked up that there's another herd around and these two herds hopefully are going to join together they will often will be associated herds that do join up so sometimes you'll get a situation where it's aunts that have left a, a herd during times where conditions weren't favorable to be in a big grouping and they then come back together again and they join for a few days lots of communication they know one another and then they kind of drift off again so maybe that's what we're seeing here is that two herds have come together and they're not tightly bonded but they are in an area because of food and water and they're then going to drift apart at some point but for now are still going to settle around one another amazing though you can see that they are lethargic though they they're hot and they probably are not really wanting to move too far i'm 100 percent sure that they've come from treehouse dam they all look fairly dark in coloration as though they've thrown water on themselves so i think they've just come from treehouse they probably had a really good swim there and a bath and and thrown water on themselves cooled themselves down and now it's just about getting into shade waiting for the hottest part of the day to wear off before they can then actively feed and really try and find you know good areas to to capitalize on and feed on the thing about it is it's going to be interesting to watch how these ellies feed over the next little bit watch how amazing this is look you see one elephant started to move now look at how the whole group is moving together and they're all coming this way so they slowly they've picked up some sort of communication amongst them there was no sound that we could hear and all of them are now starting to just drift with one another out you see how they've even turned around some of them and are starting to come isn't that incredible it's absolutely phenomenal to watch the intelligence of these elephants you can see her she's posturing at us though already eh? so she knows that there is something around and that means that our distance needs to be kept we don't need to make her any more aggressive or any more sort of upset as she is that's a really big old female she would have seen a lot and that posturing and her making herself bigger is just trying to basically check what's going on and, and inform us okay where you are is just far enough i don't want you coming any closer you're okay where you are and then she's gone back to feeding now which is absolutely fine also could be because she's got a calf near her there you can see the little one coming out even though that's not a very young calf she might have a smaller one somewhere there is why she's a little bit more kind of posturing as to what's going on but their intelligence astounds me and the, and the communication between elephants is absolutely amazing the fact that we don't hear it and that there's there's obviously a very clear indication that these guys are able to talk to one another is absolutely fascinating and phenomenal to watch now i just need to give an update on the radio quickly to the guys that are getting mobile so i do apologize yeah orbs there's a herd of elephants apparently at gari dam there's another herd here at shibamu mobile in a westerly direction quite a big slumby so there we go we've just let orbs know that there are elephants around you see that female she's still posturing in this direction now there could be two reasons for this one could be us and could be the fact that we are making a bit of noise in the form of me talking there's a scent that's blowing towards her and or it could be a situation um that we find there's a bull elephant that might be around in this area as well copy that orbs yeah i did have tracks for that uh my daughter Ingwe going from aubrey's towards gallego shortcut i didn't pick up anything on gallego shortcut but maybe you'll find some tracks there just confirm he drank at the water hole so just listening to the radio apparently there was a sighting of a leopard at some point today close to gallego pan which is quite interesting so i wonder if maybe there's not a leopard on a kill and those leopard tracks we had this morning would indicate that there would be some sort of sign of that leopard in that area i did say that those tracks look fairly good but we'll just try and carry on and find them this elephant herd itself i'm not going to go any closer she's already posturing from where she is now like i said it could be a bull elephant it might not be but i certainly don't want to push them we have elephants for the first time in a while and i want them to feel as 
comfortable and at home as possible and not push them out of this area. So let's rather just leave and keep our distance as it is. And while we do that, I believe Scotty D has found a couple eddies on his birthday and I hope it is a beautiful, beautiful sight of them as they meander through those long grasses of East Africa. It seems to be always such a pretty occasion. From a herd of elephants in South Africa who seem to be a little bit not agitated, but a little bit on edge to a very, very relaxed herd of elephants who are enjoying the soothing effects of the rain as well as, I guess, the slightly juicier grass that they now get to feed on. Makes them look so different to normal. And what I also find fascinating, if we look at this one here, there's patches of their body which appear absolutely dry. And how on earth that works, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe because their skin's... The skin absorbs a lot of the water and keeps some parts dry. I mean, there was a serious deluge earlier. So quite interesting. We haven't moved. Let me show you the spring that fell out the car. It's quite interesting. My nuts are in the way. <laughs> Macadamia nuts. <laughs> so this is what has fallen out the car, out of the back left wheel. It is called a coil spring. I am mechanically void of knowledge, so I don't know if we're even going to be able to drive the car away from here without causing damage or if we can just take it slowly. Um, so yes, I need to speak to old Shadrach, and Shadrach, I must say, has been an absolute lifesaver, him and his assistant, David. These vehicles were in a state of disrepair when we arrived here, and there's been a huge, huge amount of work done on them to get them working. So, oh, a lot to Shaddy. Cute little baby there hiding under her mom. Hello, Lorne. You would like to know what is the average size of an elephant herd? And it fluctuates greatly, but I'd say on average between kind of 10 and 20 individuals is your standard herd size. Anywhere upwards of that, you can consider to be a large herd. And right here, we've got some of them you won't be able to see because our front rain flap is still down. But I can count 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34. So this is a large herd of elephants, but there's no set rules. And often what's difficult for us to know is where the two herds have come together, like a joint family holiday as they cruise around. So when you see a 100 elephants together, that's... No way of us being certain that it's not three herds that are just converging on the same area and spending time together. So no set rules, which is, I guess, the beginning of every answer with wildlife-related questions. There may be trends and kind of general norms, but there's no set rules out here. The same goes for the size of prides of lion the size of coalitions of cheetah, herds of buffalo, they all vary greatly on the area. Okay, well, I want to give Shadrach a call now so I can work out what our afternoon is going to entail. And that way I can also let Taylor know whether she should rather go to the lines that I was planning on heading to. There's certainly some good prospects with them. So the sooner I find out what I can do with this vehicle, the sooner I can let Taylor know whether she should head off there. Just having a quick squiz with my binoculars to try and see if I can't see the lions from here. But it was a very, it's a very, very long way away. But it's... Somewhere kind of just above where we're looking at these elephants, up and to the left, on the other side of this forest at the base of the escarpments. They were somewhere hidden up there. I'm not sure exactly where, but somewhere up there, kind of where we are looking now. 
underneath some of those Balanites trees with the very flat canopies. Somewhere up there. But I don't think we are going to be lucky enough to get a view from here. We are very, very far away. Okay, good. Well, I'm going to start ringing Shaddy. I'll put it on speakerphone so you can all listen. It's, it's quite common for guys to put funny songs on for their ringtone. This is the advertisement for the song. It's called a skeezer. Jumbo Shadi. Her buddy Aleo. Pole to Sumboa. Sasa. Hio coil spring numa. Ametoka kwa gari yangu. Kabisa. Ametoka kabisa. Kabisa. He numa gushoto. Nimifanyo off roading. Alafu hi kitu ametoka. Paka ameonguka kwa. Kwa mchanga. So, sasa sijui kama ata, ata, ata rudi kwa camp, ama ata, ata haribu gari. Ata haribu gari yo lasma. Kweli? So, kabisa bwana iko, iko, iko ndani ya mkono yangu bwana. <laughs> eh. So, tu, iko, ho, iko kwa park. <laughs> Sio mbali sana iko chini kwa hii mlima. Sio mbali sana. Kwa hiyo nikimbie ama. Hapana ni, nimefanya off roading. Okay. So kama hiyo yeah, kama nilifanya off roading, gari ame uh -huh. ametoa hii kitu. So unaonaje? Nikuje juu yote ama Hapana, kama wewe unafikiri sisi haiwezi ondesha. Nita wacha gari hapa. Tukuje tuunde kesho. Aina njia ingine. Sawa tafadhali. Kwa sababu sasa hii itakula hiyo body huku kabisa. Okay. Ah yeah. haya bwana nita wacha yeah. gari hapa alafu ata oh, ataona wewe kesho asubuhi. Sawa sawa. Asante bwana. Siku njema. That's not good news. He says we cannot move the car. Huh. So we're going to have to leave it here. <laughs> Which means it's the end of the drive for us. We're going to have to get a rescue mission to come and save us, take everything off the vehicle. So, sadly, that's the end of that. Or trying to get a shot of that black-chested snake eagle through our funny little window. Oh, well. Um, we're going to send you across to Taylor, and I think you guys should all let her know that it is her responsibility now to go and head towards the uh, the Triangle Boys and the Sausage Tree Pride. She knows where they are, and I think she could get lucky with some action there a little bit later on. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Scott, we cannot move at the moment because we are in a torrential downpour. It's coming. You're going to get it just now, too, maybe in 15 minutes or so. But it is pouring down. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Jahawi, and we're sitting in a tent, as you can see. And uh, maybe you would like to see what's going on outside. We've got a little window, but we're actually going to have to take it up in a minute. We'll do quickly do that. Now, what you can't see is that that's actually coming from a little bit further, further east, but there's a huge storm that's just to the north of us that's hit us. But it is bucketing down. You know how you can just see for miles and miles out here in the Mara, and that's not the case this afternoon. So we can't go anywhere. It's unfortunately raining too hard now for us to even drive in these amazing covers. But that's just one of those things. So, Scott, we're going to have to wait until the rain stops, and we we'll have to turn around and head in that direction. This is the second set of sort of rain that we've had now which is not ideal because that means that I can't really do anything. We've been reading books, looking at bird books, making notes. Literally, that's all we can do. We have to just sit it out. But what I'm concerned about is that I see we're not far from the Kitratembo airstrip and I see vehicles that are parked waiting, which means that there must be an aeroplane that is wanting to land. I don't know how an aeroplane is going to want... Well, attempt to land in this because we can't see anything there's lots of lightning lots of thunder lots of 
So it's quite funny. Uh, but it seems as though there's gremlins all the way around. And uh, Scott, maybe that spring is your birthday present. Perhaps you're going to bounce about for joy now. Maybe you can try to do something like that. Bounce on it like Tigger. Uh, anyways, I'm going to send you back to South Africa. It seems as though they're having a little bit more luck than us in the Mara. And Noel, I wish you well on your first drive. Thanks, Taylor, and thanks, Scotty. Happy birthday, Scotty. And sorry, everyone, we've got lots of gremlins, and as you know, with gremlins, when you get them wet, they go crazy, so we've got a lot of wet, crazy gremlins running around. Um, we have found a beautiful herd of impala. They're busy coming down for a drink, which you might have seen on our live cam at Chuma Dam here, and then now they're slowly going to move off and continue on feeding. So what you're seeing here with the structure is you've got lots of adult females. You're going to see a few sub-adult males and a few adult males. It's not breeding season. Most of these females are going to be pregnant. We should... Oh, Tristan found that beautiful, beautiful little first lamb of the season a couple of days ago. So these females should uh, start dropping within the next two weeks. You're going to get ones that do a little bit earlier, ones that do in the middle, and then ones that do a little bit later. But in general, they tend to drop all around the same time. It's called flooding the market. So basically, when you have a huge group of little ones come, it's harder for the predators to take them all out, um, and rather than the one, 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 like, say, a kudu. And it's basically safety in numbers. And then what you're also going to see this time of day, because it's going to start getting dark in a couple of hours, it's not just the impala. There were some kudu that were in back there who also came down to have a drink. Uh, safety in numbers is extremely important. More eyes, more ears, more sense of smell, better chance of survival. Now, even though impala are beautiful and we love them, they're a staple in the bush, there is actually an elephant that is just down the way, which I would like to show you. So if you guys wouldn't mind, I'm just going to reverse a little bit and then just carry on over the damn wall. All right, now we get quite a few, sorry, just stand by one. There's something in a tree. Sorry, guys. Jean, did you see where I'm looking? No. So if we go at sort of 10 o'clock, sorry, two o'clock, excuse me, see that termite mound that's very pointy and then there's the marula tree with the branch that's hanging, not at a 90, but sort of yeah, there. What does that look like to you? Huh? It does, a little bit. Guys, okay, I'm gonna drive closer to that. I could just be having cat eyes, or, or it could actually be what I think it is. Jandre, I'm just gonna head straight in. Um, Jandre was saying to me earlier when we started drive, please, 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 can we find leopard? I was like, I'm always down for a leopard. I was really hoping for wild dogs. Now, if this ends up being a growth in the tree, I'm sorry, that will be your Noel moment for the day, but if this ends up being our leopard, woo, woo. Okay, so give me a few minutes. I'm also just gonna be a little bit quiet as we get a little bit closer, because obviously you don't wanna scare anything out of the position they're in. As you all know, especially the viewers that have been with us for a really long time, um, <clears throat> when you get a lot of the leopard species this side, they grow up with the vehicles. So they know our sounds, they know our smells, they know how our voices work. But you can also have a bad day. You can have a day as a human where you don't really want anyone around. And you can have days where you don't mind having people around. So let's just get a wee bit closer and have a look. We've got a kudu that's just coming through on our one o'clock there. All right, so I'm just going to lower my voice a little bit come around with the best angle I can find. Jandre, I think, I think this is your lucky day, my friend. Should we count our chickens before they hatch? All right, guys, let's see. Send some questions through, hashtag Safari Live, YouTube chat, do we think it's a leopard? Have we actually done our jobs today? Yes, either a leopard or a leopard log. I would definitely agree to that. Let's see if it's a leopard log. I'm going to laugh at myself so hard. It's a leopard log. We got too excited. And of course, 
It's a leopard log. Did you guys see that? All right, so that's your Noel moment for the day. I've gone a little bit pink in the face, but it's fine. It's a leopard log. We've been searching all morning with Tristan, as you know, and then it has to be on my first day. It's Murphy's Law, first game drive. There we go. Okay, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna go look for our elephant. Way too funny. Jandre, any comments? That's a good leopard log. <laughs> Let's go see our elephants now. All right, the other thing that was interesting about that is the wind is pushing uh, behind us and all of the impala and the, the kudus that we were seeing were moving sort of this way around so they wouldn't have smelled and noticed. Oh well. Okay. Here we go, back out the block. So Jenny Animation, you're asking about do trees mimic leopards? Look, <laughs> Jenny, oh, <laughs> yes, Jenny, the tree is definitely mimicking a leopard. It wants to give me a, an interesting start to my very first drive, but it's fine, it happens. <laughs> yeah, for sure, leopard log. Okay back out so again our beautiful little herd of impala the social structure of impala or sorry i should say the name for a group of impala is a rank of impala and that has to do a lot with the the males with the horns and also how they function in their um in their little bachelor groups but it applies for the females as well let's carry on oh i got so excited James, is there anything I'm really hoping to see on my first drive? Well, look, Jandre asked for a leopard and I really wanted to see wild dogs. <laughs> One of the reasons why we got so excited about that tree branch was for, <laughs> was for um, Jandre's leopard. But look, I'm, I'm just excited to be out here. But yeah, if the wild dogs pop up, I'm never, never gonna get rid of that one. That one will be too good. But um, as you all know, <clears throat> we didn't really get much this morning. A lot of our leopards moved over the boundaries. And I believe the last time, I don't think we saw the dogs. I think we got the tracks of the dogs a few days ago. So they're around, but not here, here. There's a whole bunch of Impala that are running down towards the dam. And then we're gonna come up and our elephants are gonna be here as well. Starling in the middle of the road there. All righty. Elephant! Okay, so these are actual elephants. They're not stuffed elephants. They're not robotic elephants. They're not trees pretending to be elephants. They're real live elephants, thank goodness. Murphy can't be that cruel. All right, so again, it's super hot flapping ears, cooling themselves down. Every animal species has a really particular way of being able to keep themselves functioning within the heat of, of the African bushveld. So something like the leopard that we thought we saw, they don't have sweat glands, so they pant, they lay in the shade, and then they move when it's cooler. For an elephant, elephants don't sleep the way that we sleep or the way that a leopard or a lion will sleep. It's just a few minutes rest here, a few minutes rest there. They constantly have to be feeding themselves. So their body structure has developed this amazing ability to lose about 80 to 85% of their body heat through their ears. So when they're cold, it's very flat. And then like you can see with that female, it's nice and hot. So she's constantly flapping. She's her own air conditioner. She's aerating herself. Tristan was talking about um, how we really haven't been seeing Ellie's and it's been nice today. I know Tris, 
um, had some Ellie's earlier, and then we've got these ones now. Scotty had his up in the Mara, but it means they're slowly starting to come back. The rains have been a little bit spotty. We had a wee bit of rain the other day. Farther east of us has been quite a bit of rain, and farther north of us, but nothing spectacular. So they're going to be moving farther distances at the moment within their home ranges to pick up on, on food and water, but they don't want to stay in one place for too long because they don't want to overutilize the area. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny little baby to the right of that big, beautiful female, just at her feet. Tiny, 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 tiny little baby. See there? So that little one looks to me like it can almost still fit under mum's belly. I'm going to wait for them to come out. I can't... Proud Cat Mama, you're wondering how much does an average elephant calf weigh at birth? Between 100 and 120 kilograms. It's a great question. Um, this little one here is flapping its ears quite a bit, but not hugely. I'm just waiting. It's standing up at a little bit higher than what I thought was mum, but could be auntie. There's another adult back there, so I just want to check. Usually, the rule of thumb is when she fits under the belly, um, it's still less than six months, and anything sort of over the belly, it's over six months, but it changes. Everything comes in small, medium, and large. But they're pregnant for 22 months, so by the time 22 months is up, you can see those females are hugely uncomfortable and then yeah 100 100 kilograms so that's that's roughly two to one to pounds <laughs> so it's over 200 pounds it's a big baby check there so something you'll notice with these ones that are feeding here is they don't have wet feet or wet trunks so they haven't come to drink yet So Sing King, you're asking, do elephants lay down to sleep or to rest, or do they stand up? It's a really excellent question. That little teeny one that we were looking at, he'll lie down. He's tired. He gets tired little legs. This female that we were just focusing on now, she'll stand up. And a lot of the time what you'll see with a breeding herd like this is the little, the tiny little ones will lay in the middle, and the older ones will all sort of stand around them in a circle in the shade. and. Um, and they'll do that. We're gonna get a really stunning sighting just now. They're all gonna come across the damn wall and they're all gonna go and head down and drink water and maybe, just maybe, do one of my favorite things, which is to play in the mud. Yeah, it'll have a little spa treatment. There we go, beautiful. I don't know if you all can notice, but you can hear them in the bushes. You're not really hearing them when they walk. It's virtually silent. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the female that's in front. She's gonna come down and lead, check that everything's okay. Then the rest of the herd will follow her down. Watch how they come down this little incline. So mum says it's okay. So little one follows. The rest are going to just check out this bush just there and then, and then come through. Yeah, they're going to come to a perfect spot. Elephants like clean water, so sometimes what you'll see is you'll see them come and mud bathe first and then drink, or sometimes if they find that there's a nice big spot of clean water, enough for all of them, they'll go and drink first and then mud bathe. So what it looks like to me is that mom's going to go through mum slash auntie because some of these aren't hers. She's going to clear the tip of the part of the water a little bit with the tip of her trunk she just did and then there we go. Absolutely stunning.
Glenda, I think you asked how much water can an elephant trunks hold or was it how much muscles? Sorry, Max. How many muscles, Glenda? So what I've read and heard is that there's about 100,000 muscles in there. So or roughly about 45 to um, 50,000 sets. But I have heard other guides give a little bit of a different number. That's what I, I know the best to be. It takes them about two years to learn how to use it and then their whole life to perfect it. Very similar to our own human bodies. It takes us about a year, year and a half to be able to learn how to walk and then um, our whole lives to develop how we function with our body. The little tiny baby is coming down to drink next to what is now its mom. So originally that little baby was next to the matriarch, that big female that came down first. But now look where this baby is situated itself. I just want to have a look with my binos. Elephant breeding herds are very communal. So like having an extended family. The way that I grew up, for instance, you know, lots of brothers and sisters, and then you've got your grandparents living with you, your cousins sometimes live with you. That's how a breeding herd works as well. And so everyone helps take care of everybody else. Uh, there, now the matriarch's gonna start to mud bathe like we talked about. So she had all of her clean water. She's got her own little patch. She's not gonna disturb the other ones from having clean water, and she's gonna throw that mud on her to cool herself down. And with the way that that little one is drinking, I'm gonna put that little one, I'd probably say eight months, 10 months, right around in there. Debbie, how does it make me feel to be so close to elephants? Debbie, I absolutely love elephants. I love elephants from a vehicle. I love elephants from on foot. We're as, right now, we're probably about 80 meters from them, but I've had many, many an occurrence where an elephant's been right next to me. I've had an elephant smell my face. I used to work with this little male elephant who would come up and chew on the side of the vehicle. He, he had a problem. So for me, it's not, I have no issue with it. It's really something special. I had a moment last year where we were with a breeding herd and the matriarch came right up next to the car. Her eye was literally ne right, not in the right next to my face because I'm sitting short in the vehicle, but just above my head. And she stood there staring at me with her eye and I stared at her. And it was just one of those magical moments. I, I can't, I don't even have words to describe. So I, I get a very calming feeling with elephants. This is a photographer's dream right now. Beautiful light. So notice they're all moving over to the big female and they're all gonna start coming and, um, and, and uh, cooling themselves down in the mud. So that second female that's moved over to the right of the big female, that is the mum of the little one. So you'll notice she's smaller than that big female. So that little one in relation to her especially her belly size makes him older than in relation if you were to put him next to that big female that's why I said we just needed to wait a minute and see also the use of his trunk his ability to utilize it a bit more it's it's quite a good utilization which is why I said eight months ten months I mean you could even possibly push him up to a year depending on who's looking and and what you're saying it look it, it's all it's all variable and it's all relative That sound you just heard there, that matriarch, there's an older calf that's there and the older calf is trying very hard to nurse off of mum. So that matriarch is looking pregnant to me. Um, she's not sitting heavy, heavy, but she's sitting heavy enough. You can see when she turns there, that bulge. Sometimes when they're heavy enough, if you look, yeah, perfect thing, Jandre, if you look right where Jandre is focusing on now, you can sometimes see the baby move we might we might get lucky it's sometimes when she breathes it's moving yeah and then sometimes you can actually see where the feet and everything is kicking through 
Um, but unfortunately she's moving off so we're going to have a little bit of trouble getting that. Very similar again to humans. All right, Tristan is down south of me and I believe he has a beautiful giraffe to show you. Everyone loves a giraffe. So we are going to head down there and give Tristan a chance to show off his skills. Well, we do, everyone do, does like a giraffe. They are quite cool animals. At the end of the day, they are a little bit different to everybody else. And I'm sure Noel is absolutely loving the fact that there's some Ellie's around. And it just goes to show you, we had the most quiet morning, not a single animal around. Now there's elephants everywhere. There's apparently Mvula is somewhere just north of where Noel is. So hopefully she'll be able to find him and catch up with the guys that side as well. And now we've got a few giraffes. Now you will see a car passing by. I do apologize. It is north of us and there is a car that is going. Luckily giraffes are tall and so we don't even have to actually see it as they go. Wonderful. There we go. Well done, Senzo. But it is a young bull giraffe that we've got feeding. He's a beautiful coloration. I know he's in the shade, but he is really nice and dark. He's got this kind of dark melanistic kind of cover, color to him. Now he's not a full melanistic individual but often with giraffes some of them will produce a lot of melanin in their coats and they will get this much darker coloration that we see here. So really nice to see these guys. I love kind of spending time in the areas where giraffe are. They often are a good indicator for a number of different things and, and so it's always good to see them. I quite enjoy having the giraffe around. Now it's just the one on his own, he doesn't seem to be with anybody else, which is not strange. Giraffe have probably the most loosest of the social structures in this area. You find that they will, you know, be either on their own or in groups together and there's really no rhyme or reason to their groupings together. You will find a situation, it's not like elephants where it's matriarchal or it's lions where there's a dominant male or leopard like that. It's really these guys kind of spend as much time as they can wherever they want. As long as there's food, they'll just mix and match with each other all over the place. Now, I have heard some disturbing news to me, which makes me very, very sad. It's nothing that's, I suppose, really too much to complain about, but it sounds like our boy Tumba crossed all the way into Mala Mala and has gone that side. Now, yeah, things that go into Mala Mala generally don't come back, and the reason I say that is because it really is beautiful down there. It's a perfect situation for a leopard to survive and move away down that way. And so Senzo is pointing to me because I have another hat on, as you may have noticed. It's all about party hats, and so I've got different hats on, and so I'm hoping our boy Tumba gets chased off by another male and pushed back into this area because I'm not ready for him to go just yet. I'll be very sad if he leaves us and goes in another direction. Right, well I'm going to sit with my party hat and my party giraffe and while we do that I believe I'm supposed to go I think back to Taylor. I'm not 100% sure but given that I'm getting a 10 second countdown it definitely is Taylor and hopefully she's having a wonderful afternoon on her side of the world. <laughs> We're shooting out of a window so kind of things are kind of time sensitive but you can look at the rain um, and there's also a whole bunch of people around us, so it's very difficult to try and maneuver. I can't see where I'm going. It's fun times in the tent. Woo! Right, off we go. Let's let's carry on. <laughs> what a fail. Ah, right. Um, so, yes, I was going to show you some elephants, but they've now gone behind the car. There's, there's not even a chance I'm going to try and reposition this vehicle because it's a nightmare. I, literally, I cannot see what's going on around me. And there's lots of vehicles that are all heading home because they've seen the storm that's coming in. Joshua, who's our Ascari this evening, says it's going to rain the whole night. We're, it, we're trying to get away from it, but we're not going to evade it. It's going to hit us, and then we're just going to be sitting like this reading books in the tent, in the car, waiting for the show to finish. <laughs> but yes, but that was our elephants. They were there. There were definitely some. Now, Kaylin, you're wondering if the Mara's got any active volcanoes or it has any earthquakes. I'm passing that question on to Jahawi. Jahawi? <laughs> Not in the Mara, but there might be some places. In Okay, so I'm going to stop so Jahawi can tell you through the uh, ambient sound. See, there's cars trying to pass me and I don't even know. So you have to listen very carefully. Jahawi's going to tell you where you can. Yes, come sit with us. Come and sit in front. <laughs> Jahawi's getting out. He's going to tell you now. It will be a minute. Well, not a minute, maybe a few seconds. He's climbing around. No shoes because that's, that's how we do it, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, so not in the Mara, they're no volcanoes. Um, but not too far away from here they are. It's called Aldonio Lingai, and it's on the um, border of Kenya and Tanzania. Um, but because it's actually active at the moment, it does send tremors, which you could kind of feel here. But other than that, no, it's um, not much. I felt a tremor once when I was at the airport. Actually, no, I wasn't. Where was I going? I think I was going to Australia. Or was I flying to Kenya? I can't remember anymore now. But there was a tremor. I thought that I was going crazy. I'd sitting down in one of the slow lounges, and I was looking around me, and my drink. I had a glass of water on the table. It's like Jurassic Park. It was just sort of ripples. And then I looked around, and no one else was reacting. And I was confused by this. It was a massive tremor. It was a big earthquake that happened in Botswana. But thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. This is the fella. If you want any question or you want any questions answered about Kenya and things like that, this is the man to go to. And Scott. <laughs> we'll just wait for Jahawi to climb back around. It's like a jungle gym in here. And then we shall continue. But I can hear a car. Is it a car or an aeroplane? It's a car. We're going to let the car pass us because I would hate to just pull out in front of them. Can you imagine? Oh, causing accidents. Right. I think it's safe. Do I need to, do I need to signal? Okay. Put my hand out and do this thing. <laughs> okay. We're going to try and get to the lions. I suspect we're going to have to zip up and bunker down in a minute, not a minute, maybe in the next 10 to 15 minutes because it is coming through. So while we do that, we slowly make our way towards the Sausage Street Ride. Tristan is out driving around and I wonder what he's going to find this evening. Well, I'm not sure either, Taylor. Hopefully it will be lots of interesting things. I do have one thing that's on the side of the car, so while we look at the giraffe, I'm just going to quickly come and get it because it went off the side. So I don't want to have a situation where it gets lost. Oh no, what happened to it, Sens? Did you see where it went? So apparently we had a... Oh, there it is. It just blends in so well, it's difficult to actually see it. Come on, there we go. Now I wanted to get this because I wanted to show all of you what it looks like. So the giraffe is behind me and giraffes have great camouflage, but not nearly as good as this fella. Now look at this, so it is turning and I'm going to turn it around so that you can see, but there is the branch. Isn't this incredible? Look at the coloration and the detail on the stick insect. So this is an insect. You can see it's got its long body and then it's got, oh, fly out of my way. Maybe the fly likes my sombrero, I don't know. But anyway, it's got these long legs, it's got this kind of a beautiful coloration that comes down, little antennas, and the eye is just here in front, and then these legs in front that kind of touch things and try and find. But that camouflage is absolutely unbelievable. You can see why it is difficult to see. It kind of fell onto the car. I don't know how, because we haven't been even been off-road really. I suppose we were with the Ellies. And so it fell onto the car and has been crawling around and Senzo managed to spot it and then it jumped off onto the side. But it is absolutely awesome when we get to see these guys. I love these stick insects and this morning I was actually discussing them as to how long they can get. So this is still a little baby in comparison to some of the others that we see in this area. Some of the others will be as long as this whole stick that we see here which is pretty incredible. Now since I know I'm shaking a little bit I do apologize. Maybe if I do this, hold on, let's put it in like that. How's that sense? Is that better? Is it close? too close or are we good? It's good. It's good. So there we go. Now I don't have to shake and Senzo can actually focus properly. It's too close. Okay, hold on. Don't worry. We're going to make another plan, Senzo. Just give me two seconds. Oh, sorry, little stick insect. I do apologize. There we go. How's that? Is that better? Perfect. So not only is that perfect, but it means I can get back into the seat and so that I can hear Megan if she's got any questions because obviously out the vehicle I can't hear very much, but that's where our little stick insect is positioned. He maybe can be our mascot as we drive around, but how cool is that little sighting? Isn't that amazing? I love the camouflage in these guys and you can see Senzo's got the eyes on the front and the little antenna. Patty, you say this is the biggest one you've ever seen. Well, like I say, this is still a little baby in comparison to some of the ones we get out here. Some of the ones are as thick as that stick that that one is on and probably about double the length. So we do get some absolutely massive stick insects in this area. It is a really beautiful creature and I absolutely love these guys. I think they're fascinating. The fact that there is an animal that has evolved to camouflage as well as that has is really something astounding. Now this particular individual is quite out in the open and is really long-legged and so it's easy to see and 
it's not difficult for us to find it when it's on a stick like this but imagine that on a foliated tree how difficult that would be to be able to actually see and to pick up now deadhead tom you want to know what they actually feel like they feel sticky so they're not sticky as in like where they stick to you but they just feel much like a stick would feel they're quite rough and abrasive on their actual sort of bodies and their legs are like any insect when they actually touch you it's, it's almost got like a little claw like structure that kind of clamps onto your skin a little bit it's not sore in any way it's quite ticklish actually but they they don't feel anything less than what a stick would feel but you see how it's able to move you can actually see how pliable it is so it's not actually rigid it's it's quite soft well where are you going you're going the wrong way you this is our extreme version of a stick insect this guy what's that too hot on the dashboard so it's now gone into the car and fallen off now of course I've set this all up thinking that this would be a fantastic idea what I haven't realized is that I've got to drive like that so I'm going to take that off not that it means anything when I'm wearing a sombrero because everyone thinks I'm a fool as it is already and people have laughed at me and taken photos already once again it's the same guide as well the funny enough that was laughing at me because he saw me in the giraffe onesie the other day and he said to me, do we dress up like this every day? And I said to him, no, not really. This is just a special occasion because it's Scotty's birthday. And now Scotty's not even in the show. He didn't wear a hat. Oh, I'm all quite sad. The problem with my sombrero is it doesn't really fit. So every time I'm driving and the wind gusts, it like pulls me backwards and falls back and almost chokes me to death. So I need to try and just <laughs> balance that out and figure it out. Ah, oh, Tulan, who's five years old. Tulan, thank you so much. It was my birthday, so you said happy birthday. But so at least me. Now, sorry about that, Tulan. We went through a little dip and we lost reception. But thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I will hopefully have a really nice day. And I hope that you're having a wonderful day as well. And say hello to Tucker for me as well. So, Tulan often asks the funnest questions. And I know that you loved our giraffe onesie. And so, hopefully, you like my sombrero as well, Tulan. I'm trying new hats today. And so, I've got this hat on. And then I think later I might try a little different combination of the hats and see. Maybe we'll get a bit fancy. Oopsie. My hat is falling off. That's what I was talking about. It chokes me a little bit when it falls off. So we don't try and squish that down a little bit so that it doesn't fall off. But I'm going to go and explore Chitwa today. We seem to have a few little gremlins if I'm driving around on Juma with Noel. So I'm on Chitwa. I'm going to go and scratch around and see what I can find. Like I say, I'm a little sad that Tumba has gone all the way to Cheetah, I mean to Mala Mala and down that area. And so I want to see if maybe some of our other leopards are around. I believe Hussan has gone south also towards the Mala Mala boundary and so has Tingana and Shadow. So all of them are moving in that direction. What's going on down there? I'm not So while I explore Chitwa, let's go back to Noel, who hopefully will have far better news regarding our spots in Juma area. Hello everyone, welcome back. So we had our beautiful elephant sighting. I'm now just trying to find a little, an actual leopard, not a leopard tree. So I'm just busy doing a wee bit of bundu bashing. Just excuse me two seconds. Uh, tax, I'm gonna thumb up just a little bit farther and then I'm gonna shut off if you wouldn't mind giving me just a quick rev, just stand by one. Yeah, if you can give me a rev now. Tax, just confirm you're about 400 meters in. Hundred percent and four hundred percent. All right, I don't know if you all could hear that. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and komo shenanik. Um, that sometimes when other people find sightings, like what's happening now, so Tax was wonderful, he found this leopard, he called us, he says, please, you must come. 
And so sometimes when we're off-roading to pinpoint exactly where they are, we do what's called giving a rev. So I stop, I shut off, tax revs, and then through the audio, that's how we find each other. It's that, it's using tire tracks, it's this and that. So we're not actually using too many tire tracks at the moment uh, because of where that leopard was and where it taxes. But I hope shortly we will be able to give you an actual visual, <laughs> not a crazy Murphy's Law le fake leopard on a, on a stick. Okay. Come on, Jigga. Okay, let's see if you all can spot the leopard before me. Or maybe you can spot tax before me. Our audio that we had was roughly here. And you heard earlier when I was talking on the radio, we used north, north, south, east, and west. And we use uh, meters to, to talk to each other about where we are, and it helps us pinpoint. So let's say for some reason tax couldn't give uh, a rev to give me audio, he would explain on the western side, go north, and we're this many meters up, et cetera, et cetera. Just come back and around. <clears throat> and then of course, while we're busy doing this little bit of bundu bashing, we also just need to be careful of stumps and artfart burrows and zebra wood, which will take out your tire one time, no problem. I also have to make sure that I don't send Jandre off the back. We need him, his wonderful camera. And then we also have to be careful of areas like this. So this is a, a little sodic site that we have over on my right hand side and it's not the best to drive right through the middle of them. We're just creeping along the edge here. Some sensitive soils there. So Ramit, you're asking what drove me to become a guide. I'm so sorry I'm not looking at you as much. I'm busy, <laughs> busy looking for artifact burials and things. Ramit, it was actually kind of by accident. Um, I was living in Tanzania, writing grants for a nonprofit for about a year and then got sort of tired of doing that. And so I decided to come down and um, that's affirmative tax. I'm just busy live at the moment. I heard your audio perfectly. I should be with you shortly. And I decided to come down um, to um, to South Africa and I got involved with research with lions and leopards and elephants and rhinos and just really fell in love with being in the bush and through that found out about guiding and I uh, went and did a guide training program and then 10 years later here I am. Did you get him? Thanks, Chandra. So this is why we have two people on the vehicle. It's not just because Chandra does camera. He's also sitting up much higher. He's got good bush eyes and he helps me out. So Chandra wins. He's spotted first. There's a lot of aardvark dongas here. So we just have to be a little bit careful. And come around from a different angle. And try not to stall out as much. There we go. Taxon, thank you so much. I've got your visual. I appreciate all your help. So as you guys are noticing, and I'm sure you've noticed with all the other presenters as well, is you can't guide in a vacuum. You can't guide in a bubble. We all need each other and we help each other as much as possible. 
Um, because, you know, in the end, it's not just us on this vehicle, but it's also the guests in the other vehicle, and then everybody here. You want everyone to go away having the most amazing experience. I can see the leopard, a real live leopard. It's not a pretend tree. All right. What I'm going to try and do, everybody, is get around him and then find a nice little stable position to stop so Jandre can work his magic and um, you all can see what we can see. So just stick with me, hang tight. There's a beautiful termite mound. Please go on the termite mound. Stand by. Pistol, pistol. Oh, sorry guys. I'm getting used to the petrol land rovers, which I have to say I've never driven until I started working with Safari Live. Their clutches are a little bit more touchy than I'm used to. Also, I'm a woman driver. Careful. That was a joke, by the way. Okay, so viewers, what I need from you all is once we get visual, I don't know the leopards here like you do. So I need you all to tell me who we're looking at. Please, share your knowledge. He is a beautiful boy. You know, to be honest with you, I actually think this might be in Vula. I've seen him Vula a couple of times. I've worked in and out of this area a little bit and I have photos of him and you see the size of that dewlap. That is an old male, but I know you all have been talking about, I think his name is Tingana. I've never seen him. So let's get a view and then you all let me know. Hashtag Safari Live, YouTube chat. Who is this male leopard? I'm currently in love, but you see the stockier short legs? That to me possibly could be in Vula, but I'm, I'm waiting for you all. Mvula, if you could go up that beautiful tree, my boy, I would be so happy. Yes, he's a stunning boy. So Tristan's birthday is tomorrow. Tristan's favorite animal is a leopard. I'm sad he's not here to watch it. He must, we must hope that he finds a leopard tomorrow. And do you remember this morning, Tristan got those male leopard tracks near the hyena den? We're not far from there at all. Okay. I'm going to uh, reverse us around and get another spot. We also have two other vehicles from Juma with us in the, on, in the sighting. So we have to make sure that they can, um, the, their guests can see as well. And so we're just going to work and leapfrog and come around each other. Viewers keep thinking, let me know. I'm pretty sure I'm going to go with Mvula. But again, you all know more than I do with rosetted cats. Jandre, I'm going to go around like that. We're going to take a nice big loop around and then give him time to walk towards us. So as you saw, super, super, super relaxed male. And if he comes up into this little spot here, he's going to get some gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous light on his face. Try this for now, see what we can come up with. I know there's a few branches in the way at the moment. Okay, if it helps any of you all decide who he is, I'll give you the spot pattern just now with my horrible binoculars that told us about <laughs> our leopard branch. James, you're saying 100% Mvula. All right, I feel redeemed from earlier. Thank you, James. Thank you for for confirming what I was thinking. Beautiful, beautiful boy. I was shadowing Tristan the other day and we saw a young male leopard. I'm so sorry, I can't remember his name just now. And, and when we went off air, I said to Tristan, I was like, yes, but that looks like Mvula. And Mvula's his dad. There's something about those almost bulldog-like legs that he has in the front. 
Okay, so he's not gonna come towards us like I was hoping. He's gonna carry on a little bit that way. So what I wanna do is to give us, again, the optimal view is let's just come around him a little bit. I also don't wanna get in the way of anyone's photography from anywhere else. So we're just gonna come around. So I am super excited. I hope you all are as excited as I am. Elephants and a leopard in one game drive really does not get much better than this. Where are you gonna go, my boy? Sorry, Jandre, I know I'm stuffing you around a little bit, but what he's doing is he's actually trying to figure out what his best course of action is. He's smelling. I'm amazed he's not doing any scent marking, but here we are, viewers. Moment of our day. Hello, my boy. So the last time I saw Mvula was in 2013. I'm in love, everybody. Definitely in love. James, you're asking which other leopards I've seen before as a guide. Um, so Tristan and I worked together some years ago, several years ago, when Karula was still alive. Um, so I definitely saw Karula, and a Tundi would have been alive then in Shadow. I don't remember seeing Shadow. I do remember seeing Tundi. There was also a huge male leopard, much bigger than Mvula. His name was Mafufunyan that we used to see in shame, uh, shortly after that, that stint. Um, Mafufunyan passed away. Um, I'm trying to think whom else. There was a young male I've been trying to find the photos of um, from 2013 that was up in a tree on one of the main, on Gowry, Maine. Um, and that I need to show Tris, or actually I'll see if I can download them on my phone, you guys can see, um, so we can figure out who that was. And then many, many, many years ago, the viewers that have been watching for a long time, just after Wild Earth and Safari Life came out with their 3D cams, I was here for an interview, and we had a young male leopard. It actually might have been Tingana, but I would need to, again, have a look at the ones that are old, because remember, young male leopards, they, they move. They move out of a territory after a while. So uh, a, a male is not necessarily gonna stick around too long while Mvula is here. Sorry, everybody, bouncy, bouncy. Um, so he might still be around, he might not still be around. Tristan was telling me some super interesting stories about several of the younger males being together in the area, trying to sort out who's dominant and, and who's working what areas and, and who's gonna take over. And it's a really interesting concept. Uh, James, I actually can't think of any other leopards that I would have seen from this, from this particular area where you all would have viewed them. But over my career, I've definitely been lucky enough to have many, many, many leopard sightings and some incredible magic sightings. There we go. That's quite lovely there. He doesn't look overly full. He looks like he's definitely eaten something in the past couple days, but nothing big. And because he's not scent marking, to me, it seems as if he's doing a little bit more of uh, checking for hunting. It's also still quite warm. So the fact that he's moving the way that he's moving in this warmth is, is very, very interesting. All right. Yeah, so William, he looks like he's definitely eaten in the next, in the, in the next, in the last couple of days. What you're seeing, do you see that flabby, flabby bit of skin that's hanging there? Mvula is old. He is an old, old man. So some of that is because of his age and it's sagging down. And then a lot of it is, you know, the, uh, when, when you're young, your skin is very elastic and it comes up and then it'll go down. So when he fills himself full, 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 it'll go elastic, but now it's not contracting as much. So I would say he probably either, either ate about three, four days ago or he um, just ate something really, really small. So yeah, I think, I think, he's, I think he's hungry. I don't think he's starving, but I do think our boy is hungry. I don't even think you guys can understand 
just how excited I am right now. I love this leopard. Look at that light. There's a beautiful little termite mound up ahead as well. Just piss off the other bar. Okay. Let's um, pull through. Sorry, Andre. While we keep up with Mbula, Tristan is wearing a very sparkly crown. I would like to say hello to everybody, so let's head on over to Tristan. Well, we are all the way down in Chitra. Unfortunately, I found tracks for a male leopard, which I think could be quarantine's tracks, maybe. They come from Torchwood and right on the sort of eastern side of Chitwa which is exactly where you saw quarantine the other day and they were going south nice fresh tracks but I unfortunately have no signal there so I can't really follow any further they turn a little bit more towards the sort of Cheetah Plains driveway area so I've had to kind of leave them where they are for now but that's okay we'll just carry on and maybe we get lucky and that track comes round again I'm gonna check along the southern side of the airstrip and just see if maybe he turned and cut across this direction but it's, it was nice to see those tracks they looked fairly good like I say they were nice and clean and I'm super happy that Noel got to see Mvula out of all the leopards that we have here and I'm sure she has seen Mvula before I know that she knew about Mvula for sure and I'm glad that she got a leopard on that side and it was worth her staying in that area and me coming south at least so that's good news and what we do have at least is not a leopard but we do have something that leopards like to eat and these ones on the airstrip are generally very relaxed and very chilled and I'll show you what they are now you might be able to see them up in the distance but there is a few of them just sitting kind of feeding off the edge of the runway which is quite nice so there is a whole family of warthogs now I don't want to go too far just in case they're not the relaxed ones because sometimes they aren't relaxed ones but you can see that this family looks as though it is fairly chilled they're just sitting they haven't even flinched since I've been coming up here so I assume that they are going to be nice and chilled like I said the ones on the airstrip generally are because of all the planes that come through here they hear planes landing and taking off and they see vehicles and all the rest of it and so they generally actually get fairly relaxed quite quickly and you can then spend quite a bit of time with them now it looks like that female also might be pregnant as well I can't see nicely it's quite far away at this stage so you can see a bit of the heat haze in the back and that's what I was referring to when we started the drive it's still very hot and the fact that you're getting serious heat haze already at five o'clock in the afternoon means that it's still very warm out here and I don't think we're gonna see too much of the animals out of the shade just yet but it will start happening slowly but surely I'm hoping that little Hosanna is somewhere on the southern side of Chitwe as well I'm gonna try to get a little closer to these guys because we are still very far away and maybe we can get to watch them rooting up all kinds of things I've interested to watch the the warthogs here because I remember watching them a few years ago when I worked at Chitwe and I always used to giggle at watching them in this area because the reason why is it's a tough area to negotiate and you might think well why would it be a tough area to negotiate it's open it's clear it's the perfect conditions for a warthog to survive now the reason it's a tough area to negotiate is that this area is covered in devil thorn now devil thorns are a type of ground cover that we get here oh there goes a cuckoo come on land for me land for me uh, no yes is it gonna land yes it did land excellent so there's a cuckoo that's landed there so there's one of our summer migratory birds sorry I'll get back to my warthog story now now I just want to try and see if we can ID this cuckoo Ooh, now you've got your back to me really okay let's just try to get a little closer hopefully it's gonna stay there I'm gonna try to get a little closer so I can just get a better sort of angle on this I'm sorry warthogs if I chase you cuckoo you don't fly got to tell everybody to stay still today because yesterday and this morning they didn't listen to me so hopefully today is going to be a better day okay cuckoo is staying fairly still it's in a nice clean background so we should be able to see what it is from here let's have a little look 
Now a very spotty barred tail and a nice little yellow eye ring and so we should be able to ID it. I just wanted to try and hopefully turn around. Did it fly away? No, it's still there. No, they've got it now. So we get a lot of different species of cuckoo in this area. Now this is one of the grey cuckoos, which is what I refer to them as. Of course this is not scientific in any way to call them grey cuckoos, but there is a few of the birds that we get out here, or well, particularly of the cuckoo species, that are grey in coloration. And they are difficult to identify and to tell which one is which. And I'm going to show you the ones that we do get here that are this grey coloration. So the common cuckoo is this individual over here which is what i think that bird was i didn't see too much yellow around the base of the beak you can see there's quite a dark beak on the common cuckoo also quite a heavily spotted tail and barred with that little white trim on the edge of it so i think it was the common cuckoo like i say i didn't get a really good look at the beak but it didn't look like it had very much yellow in it at all the other one that we get here is the african cuckoo so you can see the african cuckoo very similar in coloration to the common cuckoo but it has a lot more yellow on that beak over there and so that's how you tell the difference between the two of them and also it seems to not have as many bars on the tail as what you see and the bars are much closely or much more closely packed together now the other one that you could potentially confuse it with would be the red chested cuckoo these guys are also around this area they do have that spotted tail on the back as well but again they've got quite a bit of yellow on the beak very large sort of ring around the eye now that bird there i didn't get a clear look but if somebody can maybe check on the screenshots whether it had a dark black eye like this with a yellow ring or if it had the yellow eye like the common cuckoo that will give us whether it was a red chested or a common cuckoo i think it's a common just from what i could see from the glary picture on the presenter screen and so that would be nice now i believe mvula is mobile he's still moving and i think he's heading towards the boundary so let's quickly jump back across to noel for one last look before he leaves the area hello everyone so we're back here we've got mvula still but sadly he's very close to the boundary so we're gonna see what we can do about getting you a bit more of a view before he heads off into the wild blue yonder. He's just debating what he wants to do at the moment. Still checking, he was checking a lot of warthog burrows. He's gonna come past us now. This is gonna be really stunning. I don't know if you guys can hear the birds alarm calling in the background. All right. So you'll notice where he's just walking now in front of the two vehicles from Juma, you saw that tracker that's sitting there. These guys, these trackers are amazing. They have wildlife come right up to their feet, sometimes smell them, sometimes lick them. I'm just going to reverse just a bit for a little bit of a better visual. And um, they sit still and it's par for the course and they really, really do amazing work. All right, I'm just going to reverse without putting Jandre too much in a tree. He's gonna come into this beautiful little open spot there. Have a, have a look at you guys while we wait. All right, you can still hear the, the bird's alarm calling. And notice when he's walking, he's walking with determination. He doesn't have another care in the world. Yes, you will get interactions between predators and yes, other predators can kill themselves, but a big old male like this really doesn't have too much to worry about. Very, he's very secure in himself. Right, let's just keep with him. We're only gonna have him for another couple of minutes before he goes where we can't see him anymore. Oh, just what the heck? Thank you viewers, I'm also happy. I didn't find him, Taxon found him, but I'm happy that he decided to show himself to us. Definitely extremely happy about that. Especially as, after everyone's been waiting so patiently with our, our very cold and, and sort of windy mornings where everything seems to 
be hiding from us. All right, let's just come up onto the road a little bit. And we'll just angle ourselves for our last little view. And then let other guys take over and let Mvula go on his way. Here we go. Beautiful. Stop, check around, and then carry on. All right, perfect. So there we go, he's off on his way. Tela, in the north of the continent, well, northeast of the continent, has found us some lions. So now that Mvula has headed off, we are going to hand over to her. Tela, enjoy your lions. I hope you're having an amazing time up there today. Wonderful that you got to see a beautiful male leopard on your first afternoon drive with us. Very cool. He's one of my favorites, Mvula. But now we have not got a leopard. We have got three beautiful male lions. And you saw them this morning with Scott. It is the Triangle Boys. And the fourth one is obviously on a walkabout somewhere else. I'm not sure where he is. I haven't seen all four together. And from my understanding, from what the guides have said, is that he doesn't really... Uh, stay with the the three other coalition mem members permanently. He just sort of well, wanders through and visits them every now and then. But uh, we're shooting out of the window, just so you know. Uh, it's now started pouring with rain again. It's quite a heavy drizzle, but you can see the rain is coming. We thought at one point, because we actually put the covers up, that we we're going to get lucky and the rain was going to go towards the south and it was going to skip the escarpment. We thought, okay, if we come here, that's going to be perfect. We were wrong. We were horribly wrong. It has now engaged all the way onto the escarpment and is making its way around swiftly towards us. So that's going to be quite fun. And I think it is going to be nice soaking rain. We do need it, though. We've gone quite a few days without a decent amount of rain. You can see the grass has actually changed color quite a bit. It's not as beautiful and green as what it was. It's sort of more, more golden yellow now, like the like what the grass looks like around Serena, I suppose. Um but yeah, so it's good. And every time we have had rain as well, it's always been these short, quick downpours, which are not necessarily ideal. Sometimes a quick downpour does more damage than anything. Uh, it can cause a lot of erosion. So this sort of more gentle rain that's soaking is going to be really, really good for the grass. Are those vultures making that noise? It sounds like there's starlings or... Sh I'm just having a look. I think in this Balanites tree, you, c you can just see the corner of it. There's a bird in here that's going... You can hear it. It's alarming at the lions. It's a lionic breasted roller. Well done, Jahawi. That's fantastic. It almost looks like we're actually filming through binoculars. You know when you take a picture with your cell phone through a pair of binoculars? That's what I feel like this looks like at the moment. So that lilac breasted roller is very unhappy with the lions and is expressing it at the moment. That's that sort of... We'll see if it does it again and then I'll sit quietly so you can hear. I don't know what the lilac breasted roller is really worried about sitting all the way on the top of the tree. Perhaps he's doing his duty as a fellow citizen and a lot, well, alerting everyone else. I can see that the radio is going, but I have no comms. Do you have comms? I've got a question from Paula. What is, can I please have the question from Paula? I have no comms with FC. I don't know what's wrong with my earpiece. Do you remember it? Um, do lions, why don't they find shelter? Ah, I see there's a problem here. Okay, so thank you very much. So it's a question from Paula, and it is, why don't these lions...
find shelter from the rain. I think that's what it was. I think I see there's a connection problem here on my earpiece as well, which is why I'm not getting any communication. So um, they're probably going to get a bit annoyed with it in the minute. You saw when they were sitting, their feet sort of almost just over the tops of their heads. They've also got a big mane, though. They've got beautiful big manes. So I wonder if some of that hair actually isn't protecting their face. And I suppose as long as their eyes stay nice and dry and their ears don't get too wet and they can bury themselves, it's like having a blanket on them anyway with their with their coats. See, that's pretty much what they were doing. Look at all that hair flopping over. So it's also not too hard just yet, but if it does become torrential rain, although I feel as though the lions of the Mara are well adapted to rain because they get it so often, is they might just move under the Balanites tree. There's quite a thick canopy of leaves on top, so it should provide a little bit, unless the wind picks up. Thankfully, it's not howling with wind at the moment, because if it was, <laughs> then I think they'd move. They might even use us as shelter, might use uh, the car. Hmm, we can also get to a spot now where the rain is going to come inside the vehicle. It's okay for now. It's not blowing too badly, but uh, it's it's a tricky spot. Yeah. We need it, though. We really, really do need it. I think it's going to next few days the bush is going to look beautiful and green again now scott said he also had the sausage tree pride the two lioness with the four youngsters uh we went and had a look in the spot that he said unfortunately we didn't manage to find them i don't know i don't know where they've gone they, they might have moved out we did hear some guinea fowl that were frantically alarming so they could have gone into the lugger that would be a good spot to try and keep out of uh, out of the the rain I don't think they would have enjoyed it as much. These boys seem to be quite tolerant. Megan, can I have a comms test? I just want to try and figure out w what is wrong with my earpiece and why it is all of a sudden not picking up comms at all. Yes. Gotcha. I gotcha, girl. I can hear you. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Now, Snazzy, thank you for your question this afternoon. Uh, you're wondering if I think that there would be less flies on them during the rain. Most certainly. I don't think the insects find it partic particularly easy to fly, especially when the droplets are the size of a one-cent coin. Uh, rain is even big here in Kenya. It's ridiculous. Anyways, so they would have moved off. They also would have gone to have, uh, look for a nice sort of sheltered spot. Often they come and sit in the cars, or they'll be on a tree somewhere, on branches you'll see them resting, just an area where they're not going to get beaten by the rain. Remember, a lot of these little midges and things are absolutely tiny, and you can crush them between your fingers. So a big raindrop would definitely knock them out of the sky. So they don't want to be flying around during that. So that might be one good thing for these lions, is that they don't, um, of course, have any, any biting insects on them, except the ticks. The ticks are not going to be bothered by the rain. They're going to be holding on tight and, and continuously sucking up the blood of the lions. They won't be bothered by it. But like one yawn from our triangle boy with the blonde mane. But nothing nothing just yet there isn't any prey around uh, Scott told me I think he's telling big stories on his birthday maybe he feels like he can get away he said there was buffalo all around them and they were going to go and hunt <laughs> we have yet to see a buffalo so Jahawi as I sit here and you look at those lines would you like a cup of tea would you like a cup of tea how many sugars or do you prefer honey Honey, sure, no problem. So I'm just, it's very chilly out here today, so I just want to make sure I made a nice cup of tea in my flask. Um, what was it, what are those special leaves that are in here called? Um, the Lipia. Lipia there we go, Lipia Javanicum, which is quite nice. Here we go, to careful, it's hot. <laughs> Meg. Um, so, so can you, what, I don't actually know exactly what is, the, so the common name is just Lipia. That's correct, eh? I think it's, it's in the same family as Tulsi. Tulsi? I don't, oh. Wild basil. Okay, so it's, I've seen it growing around camp. It looks very much like wild basil, in fact. Um, it doesn't quite taste like wild basil. It's an, it's an interesting taste. Actually, while I was sick as well, Elka made me an amazing, uh, a little, 
witch's brew, I suppose. And it had the lipia in it. It had uh, fresh ginger, had some honey, it was, and then a, a hot water. It was absolutely, re it was delicious. It was actually the only thing that I could keep down, which was quite nice. Um, so, so very good for any stomach ailments if you're struggling to keep things down or stomach cramps, all that type of thing. Hmm. I'm actually glad we did tea today. We're going to do coffee, but I think that I'd be bouncing up and down and around the tent. It would be absolutely ridiculous. Can you imagine? How are our lions doing? Are they still sleeping? Yeah, now the rain is actually starting to get quite heavy. Like you, can, you might be able to hear it. Listen to the difference now. Can you hear those drops? It's not looking good for us. Now, Jamal, you're wondering if the rain would help predators hunt? Absolutely. And, and, and this is why we always cringe, is that every time I've missed a lion hunt, and I've missed a few here since I've been in the Mara, especially when I first arrived in the wildebeest and zebra just at the foot of the escarpments. And unfortunately, it wasn't because we weren't at the right place at the right time. The rain would just come down so quickly, and we didn't have these very fancy covers that we've got now. And every single time the rain came down, the lions would successfully, while they were stalking, would successfully catch either a wildebeest or a zebra, and not just one, but two or three of them if it was a big enough pride. So I think in t I missed five or six hunts. When we were there, we'd see them feeding afterwards. It was, it was often it was late at night, it was when we were trying to do Facebook Lives and things. Um, and, and, and just the rain is one of those things, nature. It, it got to us, we have to ex uh, keep all the equipment nice and safe. So we hunkered down, waited, waited, waited. And then when we rolled the covers back up again, or you know, after half an hour, 20 minutes or an hour, sometimes we waited three or four hours before the rain would stop. And either the predators were gone or we'd find them on, on a kill. So yes, it does. So not only, and we, we heard it now, we heard how loud it is. It doesn't just muffle sound, but, um, it also washes away their scent a bit, I suppose. So they've got a really, really good chance of, of catching uh, some prey. But they've got, they're going to have to move, though, because there isn't anything here. I can't see any buffalo. And when it was lighter and we drove on in, it, it wasn't particularly great. So this is, doesn't seem to be a good area at the moment. <laughs> Tristan. It seems like Tristan is having an absolute fantastic day today. I think with his next outfit, he's not going to be linked to as Tristan. He will be my big sister again, Tristina. Well, indeed, I am having great fun, and I also have a friend that has joined me. So we picked up the crown to put it on, and, well, as you can see, I now have a stick insect friend that has decided that the best place to perch is right between my eyes. It almost feels like I have windscreen wipers in front of my face and hopefully it will keep all the bugs away and I'll have a good time as I drive along. But there you go, my little stick insect friend is joining the hat party. Maybe it was felt a little left out that it wasn't on the hats and wasn't having its own time. So we'll leave it there for now. It can just do whatever it likes on top there. I don't really mind. But we're down at Chitwa. We've just been slowly bumbling about and we've been kind of moving around and trying to just see what's happening out here. Uh, very little really unfortunately can't really find any more leopard tracks I was hoping that maybe I'd find tracks for Hosanna or Tamba or Kuchava coming towards this area so I'm going to check behind Chitwa Dam wall because it's been so good to me anyway the last few days that well why not why wouldn't we it seems like a logical thing to do now stick insect what are you doing because you're now going onto my eyes and I can't see if you put your feet in my eyes the help these days can you just see what is going on here? No, that's not comfortable. Off you go. There we go. That way. No. There. Okay, that's better. As long as it stays up there, it's okay. But it keeps putting its things in my eyes. And that didn't sound very good at all. But I'm talking about its legs and its antenna and various other things. And not anything else that the mind might wander towards. Okay, no, this has got to stop because it's really not very comfortable to drive with a stick insect on the face, to be honest. Really, like I say, you can't find decent help these days. And now I'm going to try and find a nice place for our stick insect. Oh, it's gone back up onto the crown. It wants to be the king of stick insects. Oh, what was that? That seemed interesting. Or are those babblers? I think they're babblers over there. So it's always good just to check birds out, but I think they're just babblers. Yes, they are. So they're arrow-marked babblers that are just through the trees on the other side. 
No sign of our little kingfishers today, funny enough, which is not so nice. I was hoping that the kingfishers would be around, but the, the babblers are popping about. Can you see them, Sensor? Not really. You can hear them. They're calling and they're all flying over us now in different directions. There they go. They're crossing the drainage line. What is amazing to me is how little water there is compared to yesterday in this area. What's that? Ah, there we go. They're down on the ground, busy hopping around. Well done, Sens. You've spotted them there. Now, that's not one of the arrow-marked babblers. In fact, that's a Kuruchani thrush, which is not something that we see too much. Oh, did I just call it a Kuruchani thrush? I think I did. Yes, it is. So it's busy running around. We don't see them too much in this area. Well, I haven't seen too many and put them on camera, but nice to see. And you'll see they run around the ground as thrushes do. Thrushes typically are ground-based birds kind of walk around or run should I say they don't really have a walk they run quite a bit now there are two types of thrush that we get in this area we get this guy which has got the little molar stripe coming down so a little black and white stripe that will come down from the beak with those orange ish wings and then we'll get another one which is called the olive thrush now the olive thrush is not very common in this area and tends to kind of move off and tends to kind of be outside on the outskirts you see a lot of them in Johannesburg but not too many in this area so well spotted sends that's very good now in terms of which ones I'm talking about so we see these two individuals here so the olive thrush which I was referring to is this one on top you can see quite a dark back part of it with this brown sort of section that's mottled and then onto his rusty orange belly whereas the one that we're seeing now is this one below with has got this black little white um, molar stripe is what I call it, or malar stripe should I say, and then a little bit less orange and a bit of a white belly, so that's the one we see these two. And then the other one that we do get in the thrush species is this ground scraper, which you can see very difficult to be able to sort of, um, what would the word be, I've forgotten the word now, I'm drawing a blank, but it'd be difficult to, um, oh no, what's going on, my brain's failing. Maybe it's the crown. Is I'm getting older, that's why. But um, I'm getting. Uh, it's difficult to to actually not get it confused with the other, so you wouldn't be able to get it confused. Now there we go. Now what I wanted to show you actually is why I'm drawing blanks is just the amount of water that is dried up today. So yesterday when we were here with the pygmy kingfishers, this is where they were dive bombing into. Now where you see the tire track, that was water. All of this was all water and they were dive bombing into this and bathing and you can see that is shrunk by I would say two thirds during the day today. Gives you an idea of how quickly things dry out when there is heat like what we're having. So that has gone from a stretch of water all over to completely nothing and open. So pretty amazing. Now Megan, I don't know if you are still there. Megs, are you still there? Yes, there we go. Joy, the hot time of day I find, I know people often say o'clock o'clock midday for them, but for me it's not midday. I find that the hottest part of the day here is normally around sort of two o'clock. I find the heat really builds and then to two, three o'clock in the summer it is absolutely stifling and then from the start it peter off. Now it's actually a beautiful time, particularly behind here. Here is a beautiful kind of section, much cooler in behind here because of the nice big shady trees that we've got. It makes it a lot better in this area. But I find like two o'clock in the summer, it is seriously, seriously cooking at that time. Right, careful there, Sins. Just gonna get Sins through. You guys are gonna join us as we just bash our way through a little bit here. I suppose we're not really doing much bashing. It's more just creating a few branches here and there. So beautiful behind you. It's just nice to drive where there's water and greenery and grass and all those kind of things that we don't see much of these days. Well, not you can see what I mean by talking about greenery and prettiness. It's nice inside here. The muddy section, very muddy section. I do apologize. Just coast our way along. Ah, there we go. Nice and easy. How wonderful. I'm sorry, apparently we had a few picture breakups through that little section. I do apologize about that. the intentions, but it's still at least we get to explore this back end area a lot more than what we used to anyway, so it's at least something. But I do apologize about the little breakup that we have had. Right, now from here. 
Where am I going to go? I think Chip to Dam. Let's go check up on Boo and the little baby crocs. I think that's where we check see what's going on that side of the world. Nothing much else happening behind here. Right, I believe my signal is being a bit on the finicky side today, which is a bit of a worry. I don't know why it is like that, but let's quickly jump across to Noel before we do drop too much signal. And we'll see you all in a little bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we had a brilliant Mvula sighting, and now we're just busy driving around, see what else we can find. It's a wonderful, warm, slightly breezy afternoon. We've just come across this mud wallow, and I just want to sit and just chat about it a little bit. A mud wallow of this size takes roughly about seven years to, to build, sometimes up to 10 years, sometimes a little bit longer. So basically what happens, there's a slight indention, in, indent in the ground, it fills up with a little bit of water which makes mud and something like a warthog will come and roll in it and then other warthogs and then it gets a little bit bigger and then buffalo will come and elephants will come and and um, other species that that need the mud to help cool them down and then slowly over time season after season this is what happens so it's dry now but when we start getting our first rains which when i first started guiding our first rains were in the beginning of october now we usually start only getting our first rains beginning of january but i'm really hoping our first proper rains are going to happen when um uh, sort of mid-November, that would be beautiful. Get our water table back up from last year's drought. And then this will fill up again, and again, it'll become a really great place for buffalo, for rhino, for warthog, and for elephant. So let's carry on driving. Let's see what we can find. All right, now I have a very dear friend who is going to be taking an assessment at the end of this week. It is with track and sign. So I know we get a lot of people asking, what do we do outside of our time as being presenters or even if we're just guiding outside of, of being a guide? And a lot of us do activities to help build us to be better guides and for better qualifications. So with the tracking and, um, and the following of animals, you get track and sign, which is the individual track, you must ID, and then trailing, which is following, following an actual trail, say from that, that leopard and vula that we saw. And there's a thing called cyber tracker that we all use and we get graded on it. And when you get up to the seniors, it means you've gotten 100% on an evaluation. You've now been invited. It's a really big deal. It's a huge concept and it's very tough. So I promised him we would do a little bit of track and sign. So tracks, we all know what tracks are. So here we've actually got a beautiful, beautiful array of tracks. Okay, so what you're gonna see here, I don't know if everyone can have a guess. Say when am I in the way? <laughs> the car is in the way. Hold on, let me let me back up just a little bit. I parked too close. I'm still getting used to our our camera ops. Alright, Jean let me know. How is that? Still too close? Okay. Going back a little bit more. How's that? Yep. Okay. So now I'm just gonna unplug for a minute and go over there. So what we're seeing here is we've got one, two, three, four toes and one, two, three lobes at the back. Viewers, I don't know if you can maybe let me know what animal that we would find in the African bush would give us three lobes at the back and four toes, no claws showing. And while you all are thinking about that, hashtag Safari Live, YouTube chat, we can go on to what would be a sign. So that's gonna be a track, this would be a sign. So it's a very old sign, but this is what happens with elephants. They tear off the branches, they put it in their mouth, they roll it between their molars, they take the bark off and they throw it away. So these are the types of questions that you'll get on an assessment. So this question that I just picked up here is gonna be what's known as a level one question. It's very obvious what it is. This one, we'll go back. You're gonna get asked several things here. You're gonna get asked what species. You're gonna get asked male or female. You're gonna get asked which foot, so left, right, front, or back. And you'll probably be asked, possibly they might even get sneaky and just give you, just give you a toe or two. Okay, I'm gonna plug back in. 
can have a look. All right, Megs, I'm back with you. And there's also some Impala tracks we have here. Justin and Rain, you guessed leopard. Well done. So you have female leopard. Thank you very much. So you have three lobes at the back, four toes, and a very precise track. So lions will do the same. Cheetah will do the same, but they'll show claws. And then hyenas obviously have the two lobes, and they show their claws all the time as well. So this little female there, and that was her. It was looking like her front right. I actually didn't look close enough. Sorry about that. Then you'll get the Impala tracks. You also get toe tracks. You get birding tracks. But we'll carry on down the road and see if we can find anything, anything else interesting to spot and quiz. All right, we're going to head back over to Tristan and see what else is happening on the other side of Juma as we carry on looking for good questions for my friend to have an eye as he watches the show with us. Well, we're sitting on Chitwe at the moment behind the dam wall and we're watching our little plover chick, which I think is high time we give our little plover chick a little name so that we've got something to refer to it as because I keep calling it the plover chick and it's done so well to survive the last few days. So maybe if you guys want some suggestions, hashtag Safari Live. We also didn't wrap up our names for our crocodile babies too. So we need to give them a little bit, but this little one is full of beans today. It's running around all over the place. It was having a cuddle with mom just now and now it's running into this little thicket and I uh, wonder if it's going to go into the big jungle that is that grassy little area. Off it goes. There's mom keeping a close eye on it or dad. One of the two of them. So it's always nice to see them. Now hopefully the little chick will come back towards the adult and just get in under the wing like it was just now. They were right in front of the car for a long time. They sat here with us and they were chirping away and the little one was grooming mom and it was just very cute to watch the two of them kind of interact with one another. But they have gone towards the grassy area which is a good thing in a way because that grassy section is far more protected for this little chick and where it can hide. So I don't want to disturb them any further but super cute when we get to see these little ones. I love this little chick. It's so cute and the fact that we've watched this whole process kind of unfold has been absolutely wonderful so glad to see it. it's always good just to catch up with these little guys and have a little look and see what's going on now earlier I was talking about a um, story about the warthogs which I'll wrap up just now now Katniss you say Perry the plover I actually quite like that maybe we can call it Perry Perry the plover yeah has a nice ring to it so Perry it shall be yes Senza do you vote yes? Yeah, I'm voting for yes. Senzo is voting yes. So, sorry, Megan, if you can repeat what Monique has voted for, what she want. Megan. There we go. Peppy the plover. Hmm. I'm not sure. What about pepper plover? Well, uh, no, that doesn't work either. Ah, I like that one. I think that's my favorite one. Christine, you say pebbles for the chick. I also like it. Megan likes it. Senzo likes it. I think pebbles it is. So pebbles the plover is its new name and that's what our little one is going to be called. I really like that little plover chick. It's super cute. Now we're up at Chitra Dam onto the wall itself just to have a little look around. It's always beautiful up the side of life. There's lots of hippos still cruising. Oh, there's Boo. Hello, Boo. Welcome. How are you doing? There's a tiny little hippo on the back of its mom. You are super cute. What are you doing on top of mom again? Don't you love how it just rides mom? It's like a surfboard. It's just like, mom, you will stay there and I'm going to just sit on your back. I'm not interested in doing this swimming nonsense or this walking nonsense. It's far more fun just to sit on your back and walk around, except when mom moves, because obviously when mom moves, she loses balance a little bit or he loses balance. I have no idea whether it's a male or a female, but it ends up losing balance and falling off. So it's nice to see that it's worked out a way to be able to sit in this big dam and stay nice and safe and hang around on the edge. So very cool i always like seeing this little hippo it's such a special thing and it will always have a special place because such an amazing sighting that we had between the hippo itself and obviously the hosanna action that we had and all of those kind of things together so very cool to see little boo the hippo ah 
I really do enjoy Chitwa Dam at this time of the day. It's quiet, uh, there's very little that goes on. Often it's, it's the best time to be here because everybody else goes rushing off to other places and it leaves it actually all open to yourself so you don't actually have to worry too much. There is a vehicle here today but generally it's very quiet. There's just the sounds of the hippos and sounds of the birds and it's a wonderful place to spend the afternoon so super happy to be here. Now the hippo numbers in this dam seem to be actually growing rather than getting less and the reason why I say getting less is because normally at this time of the year you'll find a number of these hippos actually move out. They end up going to other places in order to try and establish themselves particularly things like young males they're going to try and get into different areas and try and find places that they can spend time that they don't have to compete with the big guys but it's still so dry that there really isn't that many places for these guys to go so the hippo numbers in Chitwa Dam are still very healthy it seems though that they kind of reach a mass. The most hippos I've ever seen in here is, is about 20 odd and it's never really gotten more than that and we're about at that sort of amount now. You can see they kind of stretched all the way through the dam so I don't think we're going to get a situation where many more hippos will be around. I think it's going to be a case where this is kind of the upper limit and as summer comes so they're going to distribute out and we're not going to have as many hippos again. Oh, there goes an eagle. Look, it looks like a Wahlberg's eagle that's flying off and that's why the great go away birds started alarm calling I was actually looking just to see if there was maybe something like a leopard walking around behind me But there goes a Wahlberg's eagle that's flying over and it's causing all the other birds to alarm call And look at how beautiful that eagle is in the light now the reason I know it's in Wahlberg's look at that tail shape It's just indicative of a Wahlberg's eagle long rectangular tail is no one else really that has a tail that shape and I also know that they have a nest just behind the dam wall here and so that's why it's easy to see but it's amazing to watch the actions of all the birds a lot of the birds immediately started to seek shelter some of them even went into trees and some of them went under trees it was amazing to watch everybody just fly off of the open sections and try and get themselves hidden now it seems as though there's another bird of prey I don't know if it's a Wahlberg's eagle just up to the left from that particular Wahlberg so there's actually two of them together there now and they both look like Wahlbergs now that I can see the tail area of the other one which is very cool so it's not just the one there's actually two of them together there's one very close and one a lot higher up and in amongst them is a few swifts and swallows as well so really really cool to see can you imagine just driving well I mean flying around like that over a dam like this it must be just so beautiful I suppose we do imagine and we know what it looks like given that the drone has been able to go over places like this and get that bird's eye view so to speak and so we do get that same kind of feeling but well done Sens that's very cool and the light on that Wahlberg's eagle is just phenomenally good it's beautiful light that it's got on there it's that time of the day and to the soundtrack of the hippos as well very nice now the rest of our hippos have all kind of started to gonna wake up a little bit so as soon as you get one snorting like that it often gets all the others to poke their heads out just to see who's talking and what's going on and why are they all talking and then you'll find they kind of go under again and so it's nice to hear when they kind of making a bit of noise and then you see them all kind of all popping up and of course the sound itself is just synonymous with Africa as soon as you hear that snorting grunting sound you just know that you're in somewhere in Africa and you're in one of Africa's beautiful spots because obviously these guys spend a lot of time in water now earlier I was talking about our warthogs on the airstrip and I was telling you that I always used to giggle at the warthogs on the airstrip and the reason why I used to giggle at them is because the poor warthogs used to feed on the edge of the, the airstrip and, and there's this plant called the devil thorn so I found some of it while I was at the airstrip itself this is what it looks like it's just a bit of ground cover that kind of hangs around on the ground it grows very much like this and lots of it it will kind of clump out from a central point and then you'll find that it'll get a beautiful little purple flower onto it now it's called a devil thorn because it does have a seed pod that has two horns on it I couldn't find a seed pod I walked all over the place there trying to find them it's not the right time of year for seed pods unfortunately Unfortunately, the seed pods generally are here in the summer months as you would expect and so I didn't find any but the devil thorn name becomes comes from the thorn itself like I say it's got the two little horns on it and I laugh at the warthogs because they feed off that area and then every now and then you'll see them kind of get a fright and it's normally because they've either kneeled or they've stood on those thorns and those thorns are incredibly strong and powerful and they'll pierce up into the sort of hoof itself and cause a bit of an issue or they'll pierce even the 
um, actual knee of the, the warthogs and they get a kind of fright and they jump and then scream off running and it's all because of a thorn so I always get quite entertained by them but this plant is is really one of the most amazing plants that we get here in in this reserve well I always think so and the reason why a lot of you will know this from watching before but some of you may not if I take this plant and I'm gonna do it for you just for the sake of it because why not and I just put a bit of water on the plant itself so if we take the plant sorry sense I'll put it back there now and we just put a bit of water on my hand sorry I just want to do it on the other side so that if it leaks that it goes out of the car not in and I take this and I actually rub it so if I just scrunch it all up and I rub it for a while eventually what's still going to start happening is I'm going to start getting a very soapy sort of texture that's going to start coming so it's going to get a bit sticky and soapy and this is because this is a natural soap and shampoo for this area so if you take the stuff and you rub it it is going a little slimy it's difficult to actually see it I'm trying to show you but if you look between my fingers as I open and close my fingers you'll see that there's a slime that is developing there so just between there you see as I close it, you'll see that slime. So it's difficult to show it, but there is that slime that I'm talking about. Now that slime, you can cover your body in it. It's very, very good for your skin. It has a, a cleaning agent basically that keeps you in good condition. Also very good for your hair. And it does get a bit sticky, uh, but once it dries properly, it actually loses that stickiness altogether and becomes quite nice. They also use it as a natural sun cream. So this gets put on the skin itself and forms a nice layer and it actually stops the sun from burning you. Apparently, I've never tried it myself, but that is apparently what happens with it. And the other thing that this plant was used for, it had a, that seed pod that I was telling you about with that really sharp pointy sort of top to it was actually used for s committing assassinations and you might wonder how they managed to do that but what they would do is they would set that pod down in front of somebody's house and put it basically on the step of somebody's house and as they would walk out they would lace those two po little points with poison now those two little points with the poison on them as the person would step on it it would go into the foot and that would cause a situation where they would get a you know basically poisoned by that chemical and they would then die from it so it was the perfect thing to use in order to try and commit an assassination because no one would have suspected a little seed pod on their doorstep quite sinister but very clever in a way as well <laughs> Right, now I'm going to just sit here a little bit longer. I'm going to go quickly check on our little baby crocs towards the southern side of the dam, see what's happening with them. And so while I do that, let's go back to Noel, who I believe is tracking and is on the trail of some sort of animal. I hope you all enjoyed the soap with the thorns, with the devil thorns there. We have some more tracks for you. So what I want to show you first is just over here. I've got a little piece of, of grass just to show you. This very, very round, hard track. You can see the little... Uh, push up from the soil here and then if you come with me a little bit to my left but to Jandre's right you're gonna see the full track in this deeper soil here so now this is an antelope track it has two lobes with a split down the middle all right the direction of this track is headed this way and what you're seeing very very interesting here is you've got a single track that we saw at the back there's another single track there coming into a single track and then as we move farther along you can see what's called track on track walking so one track on top of the other and then here but it's not an entirely precise track on track walking so this particular antelope species only does track on track sometimes it can be easily confused with a wildebeest this is not a wildebeest this is looking like a female water buck the reason why I say female is just the size of it but now if we come back here there's another track just this side. So if you were to look at this track wrong, you might think it has one, two, three toes moving that way, something like an aardvark. Or if you look at it correctly, which is actually this way, you've got that little dip that we talked about where it's pushing. Here's the middle with the two lobes. And then this little part that you see on the side is actually the front foot. This is a kudu and they do definite track on track all the time. So it's front foot, next foot, behind to minimize the noise that they make. So these would be, depending on the substrate, level two questions in an assessment. And, and remember with these sorts of things, it's all gonna be different, it's all relative. Substrate, soil, 
uh, how old they are, uh, all, all plays into the difficulty. And for some people, what might seem like an easy question will be hard for someone else's, and it's up to the assessor to figure out how, how that's going to work. So what we're going to do now after a little bit of tracking, and antelope tracks are the best because they give you huge, huge variables. We're just going to keep driving down. There is going to be a gorgeous sunset happening in a few minutes. And yesterday was full moon. I think Tristan said it was the beaver moon. So today it's not going to be full moon, but it'll be the day just after, obviously. So hopefully we'll get a little bit of contrast there. So let's hop back in and then I can plug back in and then you can ask me any questions. I can hear Meg's finally. Hello, Megan. All right. Oh, Joy, that is a fabulous, fabulous question. Joy is wondering, what is the difference between a ranger, a scout, and a tracker? So technically, I'm a field guide. I'm not a ranger. There was debate over, over the name. It is interchangeable. A true ranger is someone that is out in the bush checking on things. It's actually a term that comes from the rangers in America in the national parks there. But again, we use it interchangeably in our field, but technically we're field guides, nature guides. A scout depends on what country that you work in. So for instance, I was just working up in Zambia in South Longa National Park. The gentleman that would go on vehicle with me sometimes at night and then on walks with some of the guides, he works for the National Parks Board and he is someone that comes in and uses the rifle in case of scenarios and um, is trained, but then also does anti-poaching work. And then a tracker, Herbert, who you guys all know Herbie, so he does our bushwalks with us. Herbie is a tracker, but Herbie is also a guide. But Herbie started out as, well, he started out uh, differently, but he turned into a tracker. So that's the guy, when we saw the Juma vehicles, that sits on the bonnet, and he sees tracks, and sometimes he does it from the vehicle, and sometimes he gets off on foot and follows, and then he'll radio and say, I have this leopard here. So those, those very briefly, those are the differences. So usually a scout and a ranger is someone that works away from guests, and a tracker and a field guide works with guests. All in conservation, all within the reserves, but slightly different tasks. Great question. Oh, sunset. Okay. So Tristan has some crocodiles, I believe. So we're going to link back over to him and uh, see what he has to say and then carry on looking for some surprises for you all to view. Well, we have found our little crockies and they are sitting, just one that I can see. I think one slinked off into the water when I first arrived and they camouflage so well that I'm trying to scan the bank to see if the rest are around but I can't find them. Now, I know I asked for names the other day and I, I remember somebody calling them Huey, Dewey and Louie. Was that it? Was those the three names for the, for the, the ducks? Yeah, I think they were. So I think those are good names for them, Huey, Dewey and Louie. That's what we'll use for our crocodiles because they seem as though they're going to be mischievous and full of nonsense. Now, there's a bird that flew far away, unfortunately. Don't worry, Sensi, you won't be able to get it, but it was a... Chicana. Now, Chicanas are birds we haven't seen quite a while, so I'm going to might try to go around and find it again just now because our little croc is fast asleep and taking it very easy, and the babies of Chitwa are still doing just fine and going to, well, just doing perfectly well. I think that they're going to slowly grow. Obviously, we're not going to see big changes in them, but it's so wonderful to come here and be able to follow the story of all three of these little babies. So our little plover, our three crocs, and our baby hippo all still doing absolutely fine. And I would imagine we're going to have far more babies in the form of maybe some baby weavers that are in the weaver nest. There might be some little lapwing chicks at some point, Egyptian geese youngsters. So it's all going to happen. There's going to be a lot of different things going on. Now I don't see any sign of mother croc. I don't see her anywhere in this section so maybe she's off hunting at the moment. She might be or she's just submerged somewhere close by that we can't see her at the moment. Remember crocodiles are incredible and they're able to hold their breath for up to two hours, generally around an hour but up to two hours and that's because they can control their breathing and they can also 
control their vascular system by restricting blood flow to the extremities it means that they don't waste oxygen to the tail and the feet when they are not moving and that's when they're sitting on the bottom or waiting for prey animals they'll just slow their breathing rate down I mean their heart rate down and that heart rate can go to as much as two beats per minute which is absolutely phenomenal and it means that they just slowly moving that oxygen around the body enough just to keep the muscles alive effectively and then from there and they were able to launch an attack and so for two hours they can be underwater at the extreme point generally about an hour so she might be somewhere sitting there with some of the other little ones that are around but still nice to see nonetheless right i think let's leave our little crocs for now we're going to head to try and see if i can get that jacana there comes a fish eagle flying over no it's going the wrong way i was hoping it was going to come towards us it might still it's on the other side of the dam no hold on sense it might come back because it's not going to go into the lodge itself so let's see, it might turn and come back again, but it was just beautiful light. No, it's obviously found the perch there somewhere. Hmm, maybe let's, if we reverse, we'll be able to find it somewhere in this general section. Hold on, Sensei, I'm just going to reverse back for you a little bit. I think maybe it must have landed in one of those trees behind us here, because it turned up towards the lodge. And I'm just trying to think what trees it could have landed in. There's not too many big trees in that general vicinity oh there it's landed it's very close to the lodge itself which we're not going to be able to show you which is not ideal that's okay we'll just try and see if we can go and find the jacana now there's somebody else that's on the damn wall so i'm just going to be careful as i'm reversing and going backwards and see if i can avoid them at all cost it's actually a friend of mine that i used to work with at simambili so it's lazarus who works at the lodge next to simambili called intoma which is the sort of shareholders camp and so he kind of spends his time we're driving them around now Senzo is pointing to my hat because as you can all see I've just spruced things up a little bit and as Megan said it's my vibiest version ever and so you can see a nice kind of thing that's going on so I've combined all three together for the my final appearance and hopefully like I say Scotty D appreciates this because well nobody else joined me and so Taylor Mac I want to know why you didn't join us this afternoon you're normally one that's always game for these kind of things yet today I've been kind of left on my own to wear the hats and be the fool out on the bush which is okay I don't really care Oh, that sun is still very bright. I was hoping that we would have a nice sunset that I could show you, but it's still a little bit too high and a little too bright. So I'm going to head a little bit closer towards where that jacana is. Now, where the jacana is is actually quite difficult. If you look in the middle of this dam, there's a little clump of vegetation, it looks like. So it looks like just kind of some of the sticks and things that have come up together. There it is. And so on that is where the jacana is sitting. The jacana is sitting on that little section there and maybe that's why it's nesting there is because it's so isolated it's going to have very difficult for things like monitor lizards to head into that area and hunt them and to go after the eggs or anything like that so it's the perfect place to sit and to be, take it easy now i can't see it from here but if i think if we go round, we might be able to have a better view of it if we go onto the other side of the island there we'll be able to see into the nest itself and see the jacanas now jacanas like i say are not something we see too often i mean more in the summer months when things are a little bit more sort of damp and wet and so i'm sure we'll find them at that stage but hopefully we can show you this one because it's been a while now while i kind of talk about birds and try and find this bird i believe noel has got a bird of her own much larger and in a beautiful tree welcome back everybody we do have quite a large and beautiful bird thank you tristan very much i hope you find yours as well here we have a white-backed vulture so no i don't think anything's dead under there one reason is usually when you have something that has died you'll see quite a few more vultures you don't have to necessarily have hundreds but you might have two or three but the sun is setting this vulture is not going to be flying around in the dark he's too big so he's just found a beautiful little roosting spot and um, the reason why i say white back has a lot to do with his coloration and where he's sitting and also the color of the eye if he was a cape he would have i believe it's a blue ring but before i pull another noel move for you guys today let's just triple check that vultures are really amazing they are birds who take care of the basically the garbage that we need in the bush they're immune to many of the diseases that come out here so here we've got the um, cape vulture you can see that light colored eye and then the white backed vulture has the dark eye um, there's that little bit of blue on that one here with the juvenile 
Oh, sorry, there we are. There we go, Jandre. I'll be Vanna White. Here are your vultures. Jandre would have seen Rupel's vulture up in the, in the um, Mara when he was just up here. And then also white-backed vulture is just much more common than the Cape vulture. And that has a lot to do with the, the numbers plummeting. But if you look over here, we were talking a little bit about earlier about uh, the difference between a guide and a scout and a, a tracker, etc. When you're starting to learn to guide, or even just now, if you're in an area you don't know or an area you do know, you use these little things on the side to figure out whether or not the bird occurs here. So if you can see Swaziland there, that's that little bump, and then just above there in the green zone, that's roughly where we're located. And so yes, it's dark green, it means it's here all year round. And then here, we're just sort of the line of year round and not as common year round. Alrighty, so he'll sit up there for the evening. And then tomorrow morning, after the, the sun warms up the, the earth and the thermals start rising up, then he'll catch a thermal off and start looking for food. So the way, these, we have old world vultures rather than new world vultures here. So old world vultures find their prey using sight, whereas new world use sense of smell. So new world you would find in, in South America where there's a very broad, thick canopy and they need to smell the dead carcass as opposed to see it. Ours do sight, they also watch each other. So if they're up in a thermal and they can see vultures moving in a line and getting low, they'll follow to investigate. And then those vultures a lot of the times are following things like battler and tawny eagles who hunt on their own but will also be the first to get to any dead kills. So they're all keeping an eye on each other. And when you get these thermals up like this, you've got the battlers and the tawnies down below and then you're going to get sort of the, the white back in the cape and sometimes the lapid face in here below, but not always. Sometimes they're up here, but a lot of the times they'll be the ones that open the carcass. This is extremely interesting. All right, so we on our other side have set up another beautiful view. It's not a bird, but it is a gorgeous sunset. So we're just going to take a quiet, quiet moment. Let's say it's for Scotty D's birthday and watch the gorgeous sunset on Juma. Magic, absolute magic. Louise was saying in FC the other day that she loves the sunset, and I have to agree with her. So Snazzy, you asked, um, what stops birds from traveling around the globe and staying in one country? Well, Snazzy, every bird has a different way of being. So the ones that we just saw now, they don't need to migrate. Everything they need, food, habitat, all the resources they need are here. But there are birds that will fly Oh, say from China, from Mongolia to here. So you get the Amur falcon that travels every single year, thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers. You get some birds that travel from sort of Central Africa, East Africa, and then travel down here to us, like a Woodlands Kingfisher for summer. So, so everything is different. Um, so nothing stops a bird, but everything has to fit its niche and everything has to fit the habitat and the food sources that are there without overly competing with other, say, bird species in this instance that would make it that they can't survive either. Um, so for instance, vultures fit a very particular niche that allows them to access a food source that not many other birds can access and therefore they don't really need to move very far. Now the Rupel's vulture that I mentioned earlier, we do get rare sightings of it down here, it will happen. Um, and you also see white-backed vultures when you get up into Kenya area as well. They just happen to fit better into the ecosystem of say East Africa than into our ecosystem down here. Um, so for instance, I worked up in the Mara a very long time ago. And I remember seeing much more Rupu's vulture than it's say the cape and white back that we would see here. Just as, as a side note. All right, so we've had our beautiful vulture moment. That was a fabulous question, by the way. We've had a beautiful vulture moment. We've had our beautiful sunset moment. We are gonna carry on and see if anything will poke its head out in our last little bit of time we have together. Maybe we'll get some interesting nocturnal creatures like civet. I would love to see an aardvark 
I haven't seen an art fark in a very long time, but while we're busy looking for you, let's head back over to Tristan at Chitwa Dam and see what he has for us. I am indeed. I'm loving my time at Chitwa Dam. We just had a beautiful herd of impala coming down now, and they hopefully are going to have a drink. So I'm going to stop here fairly shortly so that we can watch them drinking as they line up on the edge. And it's always obviously a bit of a, a tough time for impalas when they want to drink because they come towards the edge of the water. They know it's a dangerous place to be because of the crocodiles that we get in here. And so they come down tentatively and they kind of move slowly towards the water to try and drink. And you see it's quick sips and then back again, quick sips and then back again. It's not like what we see from somewhere like um, Twin Dams or Treehouse Dam when they tend to sit and drink for long periods or even Gallego Pan. Here they tend to move down and then they drink and they slowly kind of sip little bits of water before they decide, nope, sorry, they've lost their nerve and then they go back a little bit. So they're being as brave as they can and you can see they're kind of pulling back as they busy drinking. <laughs> Shame, it must be so nerve-wracking for these guys to drink on the edge of this dam. I mean, the crocs here are not small and they would easily take something like an impala and certainly revel in being able to hunt these impalas. So I do feel for these impalas when they do come down. It's never the most pleasant experience if you are an impala to try and have to do this and to try and drink and get water from an area where you know lots of crocodiles are spending time it's very unpleasant i would imagine and i feel for them but at the end of the day it's got to be done and they've got to try and the crocodile is also got to eat so you kind of end up with a situation where everybody tries to kind of watch each other's back and a few will then try and drink while one or two sit and watch and take in what's going on you see and then every now and then they lose their nerve and they'll back off thinking that maybe something is there and when one runs they all run and they'll all come away from that little section. Now there is a bird that is right near where those impalas were drinking. Where that impala is coming down sends if you just follow the edge and then just zoom in for me towards that point over there. Come down a little bit, come down a bit, down, down, down. So down more towards us. More, more, more. Come, come, come. A little bit more. There it is. Do you see? Look, it grabbed a fish. Did you see that? How cool is that? So it was a green-backed heron and it was just on the edge and it went in and smashed a fish. So I was hoping that we would see it hunting and I was about to say that these guys are some of my favorite hunters and you see it grabbed itself a little bream species. It's also in its breeding colors. You can see it's got its red on the chest with a white stripe there. So it's in its breeding coloration. It is a green backed heron and it's managed to catch itself a little bream. And that's a really good meal. You can see now it's going to kind of get it in its beak and it will eventually try and figure out how to actually sort of get it and might even hit it against the, the ground and try and sort of stun that fish before it then swallows it. But that's going to be a really good meal. Well done green backed heron and just in time as well to see it kind of splashing in and grabbing it so that was super cool I've been wanting to get one of these catching a fish on film for a long time and on the cameras and there we go it's kind of stunned it and now down the gullet it goes and that will be a proper meal well, you can't stop halfway there we go and in it goes well done heron that's very clever that is so epic That is so cool. So Taylor says to me, a little drink of water to wash it down. Well done. Clean the beak as well. Make sure that there's not too many little scales and things left on the beak. You see, just cleaning it, a bit of water. Do you see how far its neck stretches out as well? So this heron looks super compact and you would think it'd be difficult to get to fish and those kind of things. But look how far that neck stretches. You see, it pushes the neck right out towards the water and can drink and stay a safe distance away so that things like crocodiles don't get to it. But there we go. Look at that. And then in the background was a little pied wagtail that also ran away. So it's all happening. Now Taylor was saying this is an early birthday present because she sat hours with this green-backed heron trying to get it to catch a fish and I think so Taylor I think it's definitely a little birthday gift from the birds of Chitwa themselves that was so cool now the chances of seeing that are so rare I mean you can spend hours as Taylor mentioned watching these guys and you won't see them grabbing a fish so that is just super special and we've been spoiled to be able to see that oh you'll fluff it up I, mean, I wonder if that fish is still wiggling inside there which is a bit weird Cheryl, you say it seems pretty big for a little bird like that. Well, that bird, funny enough, 
is a little bigger than you think it is. I mean, it is small and that fish was quite big, but at the end of the day, their neck does stretch out a little bit and their stomach will be big enough to cope with that. It'll just digest that fish. And you can see it's still on the stalk. It's still moving around, keeping its profile quite low. So that's not enough for it just yet. They're still looking for more. And if we stay on it for long enough, maybe we'll get lucky and we'll see another little strike out at a fish. But it's definitely got its profile nice and low. When they are hunting, they do do this. They get themselves kind of creeped down, much like a leopard would. And then you'll see that neck just shooting out and then going after a fish. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see it kind of trying to go quickly into the water again and grabbing whatever it's looking for. So while that seemed like a big meal, it still will hunt a little bit more and it will still try and make use of the conditions. Now is the best time for it to hunt. It's, it's kind of low light so the fish can't see as well and it makes it much harder for them to be able to see that bird of prey right on the edge of the water. Snazzy who say they must have a pretty tough digestive system, well yes, I think all of these birds that eat fish must have really strong constitutions because it's swallowed that thing alive and that poor fish is going to be digested very quickly by those stomach acids and break that all down and it'll break down the bones, the skull, everything, which is amazing. I know fish don't have the hardest of bones, they, their bones tend to be a lot softer than what we see kind of in mammals but still to break that all down is pretty amazing but you see how it's just positioned neck is cocked in so that as soon as a fish comes anywhere near and its eyes are able to detect the movement it can strike out using that long there we go hold on it looks like it might go again let's have a look now you see how it's waiting it's patient it's creeping forward it's obviously spotted a little bit of prey and some of the fish cruising the shallows very close to the edge of the water so it's gotten itself nice and low its neck is all tucked in and it's going to try and strike out as soon as that fish comes past so it's in prime position now to be able to go after some sort of fish now how long it's going to take until it strikes out I'm not quite sure it's still just working out exactly what it's got to do and it's got to calculate for diffraction and all kinds of things within the water before it then shoots that head out into the water itself so let's just see I wonder no it seems to be settling down a bit now it's not as poised as it was a few seconds ago Eduardo, you say, could it really swallow another one whole? Well, I think it's going to try. Maybe this is the glutton of the heron world, and maybe, just maybe, it's going to try and find itself another little fish. I would imagine it's going to go to bed shortly after that, and it will be very satisfied with itself if it does grab another one, because that will be perfect to sleep on. There we go. Did you see? Oh, it missed. But did you see how quickly it goes in? How cool is that? This is so epic. Now, I know hunting cats are always something that we try and find and we try and look for these kind of epic moments with cats moving around, but watching this bird go after prey animals is just as exhilarating and just as exciting. And its patience and its stalking capabilities are amazing. I love watching these guys go about their work. The other thing with these little herons is that they will actually sometimes even bait their prey animals. So they'll put something like an insect on the surface and they wait for the prey to come, or I've seen them doing it with bread before as well. And as the fish come to feed off it then it launches look you see it's spotted again keeping itself low it's just like a leopard there we go it's going in did it get anything I don't know I think it no I don't think it got anything no it missed again it was a bit hasty on that approach but it's still sk skulking along still looking absolutely amazing little heron are you still hungry you can't be that hungry surely not maybe it's been a hot day and it's processed everything and it's still got a little bit of a stomach to fill up now, you would wonder how big this bird is. There's a bit of elephant dung to be able to give you a sort of size kind of comparison. So that's a rather large bolus of elephant dung, but it is still gives you a nice size comparison. Now, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, you want to know, would a fish eagle steal a fish from this green heron or striated heron? Yes, it could potentially if the fish was large enough. Something as small as what you saw there, it's not really worth the fish eagle coming in and trying its luck. It's not going to get anywhere with that. It's not really going to be worth trying to spend the energy to swoop down, chase this bird off, grab that little fish and swallow it. So they don't really do it too much. What you will find will bully these green herons is other herons. So if you've got something like a goliath heron, a purple heron, grey heron, black heron, heron all of those bigger herons would chase this little heron away and try and steal the food now where it's hunting now is actually a very clever thing 
And the reason why is because elephant dung, often I've seen fish hanging around elephant dung and it's not because they're feeding off it, it's just a point of structure. And structure, as we know, is a great place for fish to hide and to be able to kind of conceal themselves. And so maybe there's a few little fish. No, it's decided next spot, next bay is where it's going to go fishing. See, this little heron doesn't waste time. It's not going to worry about sitting in the same spot for hours. But you see how when it gets close to the water, like I said, it stalks just like a lion or a leopard would. Gets its profile nice and low, gets itself poised and hopes that the fish will come in within striking range. And then it darts forward with that lightning quick reflex and goes after it. Will it attempt again? Let's see. It's amazing. Look at that. You can see how that eye is focused as well. And it's trying just to watch and work out exactly what's going on. And how it does it, I really don't know. I mean, you look, there's a ripple on that water. It's difficult to see anything. But yet this heron is spotting fish somehow. It really amazes me. I wonder if it picks up the movement of the fish just underneath the water surface and is able to differentiate ripple from what a fish movement is. It fascinates me watching these guys go about their business. Now we may not have seen too many of the bigger animals this afternoon, but this has just been a highlight of my week for sure. Absolutely amazing. I wonder if it's going to grab another one for us. It's certainly trying. There we go, there we go. It's getting closer. Now let's see. I've just got to wait for it to dart in to that water and grab those little fish. Now I'm speaking in a hushed tone, I'm not really sure why, because the fish generally won't hear me and it's but it's still it's just too exciting and I don't want to spoil it so I don't want to make too much noise it's so cool come on are you going to grab another one let's see there we go did you get it no it missed again oh no so so far we've got a 25% success rate out of four attempts we've had one successful attempt but that's not for lack of trying. I think it will get it right eventually. The problem is it's running out of light now. So it's going to get to a point where it's going to need to go and roost and find an area to try and spend time. But that was just so cool to watch. It's not something we're going to see every day. And maybe at this time of the day is the right time to be with these green herons and green backed herons and to try and see if they do hunt more. It is drifting a little far for the camera now, particularly with the light that we have. But how amazing was that? I'm so excited. Now I was saying that it's in breeding colors so while I kind of keep an eye on it and see if it gets back closer to the water I want to show you what I'm talking about when I refer to breeding colors um, herons are at the front of the book not at the back I don't know why I was paging so far where are you green backed you should be here uh, no not that page sorry guys I'll get to it eventually where have you gone green backed heron it's still just kind of drifting on the edge of the bank there so I'm just trying to find exactly where it is in my book. Why can't I find it? White back night heron, dwarf bits, and ah, there it is, green back herons. Now, this particular one doesn't show the breeding coloration as much as what maybe my app might show, but I'll explain to you what I mean anyway. Now, you see that this is the adult bird, which is pretty much what we're watching. He's got that sort of black top to it, that little green back that gives it its name, and I was saying that it's got this rusty red and white stripe on the legs. Now, you notice that it's got a bit of yellow on the beak area, or the sear kind of area if you were thinking of a bird of prey, and yellow legs. Now, if you looked at that bird that we just saw now, its legs were more an orange color, and what happens when they're in breeding is this section here goes orange, and so does this on their legs, and they become a lot more kind of colorful with that also this becomes much deeper coloration that we see on the chest and on the back area and that's how you can kind of tell when they're in the breeding coloration which is very cool so this one is in that stage and it's about the right time of year for all of these things to happen so I'm going to leave our green bacterium because it's, I see it's just kind of flown off onto the other side. It's a little far and out of our reach. I'm not going to go around to the Jakarta. It's going to be a bit dark for that. So I think we're going to leave Chitwa Dam. It's been an absolute wonderful afternoon just spending time at Chitwa. And it shows, goes to show if you're patient in the wild and you sit for long periods of time, anything can happen. And so while we meander back to Juma and see what else we can find, let's go back to Noelle and see what she's managed to get up to over the last little bit. And hopefully there's lots of little things lurking for her to find. Welcome back everybody. We have some beautiful male waterbuck. Uh, we had those waterbuck tracks earlier. 
from that female. And here we've got a, a group of satellite males. So a male will take anywhere from about seven to nine years to establish a territory. And so until they're old enough, um, basically what happens is they form these little bachelor groups and they work on the outside of a male's territory. And as long as they don't do anything overtly dominant, they're allowed to stay there. Now eventually, I don't know if you can see the one in the middle there, looks older than the other two, from my guesstimation. He will shortly probably take over whatever ter territory he's busy on the periphery with. Um, I love, for some reason, I just really love water bucks. They're fuzzies. They remind me of donkeys for some reason. Donkeys with antelope, antelope horns on them. Absolutely beautiful. And very relaxed with us especially, but also relaxed in the space that they're in at the moment. Look, I've been sitting with, with antelope species like this before and a lion or a leopard has jumped out and killed them, but in general they do have an idea and there is a faint breeze going on every now and then. So I think they're just happily working their, their way through their, their feeding habits. They're not going to sleep tonight. They will keep feeding throughout the night. Something that's very useful to know about water buck is if you're ever lost in the bush and you find water buck, it means you're within at least two kilometers of water. Uh, they, they don't really go farther than that. And the drier it is, the closer they'll, they'll be to water. So if you follow the pathways and we're teaching you all about tracking, they'll meander down and, and it can help you find water. Joy, yes, the water buck are extremely beautiful, especially the males and the full grown males when they've got the, the, the big beautiful horns. The one in the middle that we showed earlier has a nice set, but there's some males that have an even bigger set. And there's just something about them, especially when they stand with their bum with their little white circle and then they turn their head over the shoulder. Absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. All right, let's carry on down towards Chelapan and see what we can find there. Maybe the hyenas that Tristan found the other day. Thank you, water buck. You were beautiful as always. This is my favorite time of evening. So after the sun sets, you have about 20 minutes of usable light for, for walking or without using a torch. But the stillness, the quietness, and the pastel colors that come out right now, it's very calming. It's very low. All right. We are going to send you back up to Puebla. Shame, Taylor. I'm so sorry about that rain. Head it back up there and let her tell you about what's happening in Kenya must enjoy. Thank you very much. It's fantastic. It is not going to stop. I think we might even have rain in the mor morning. How exciting is that? Now, Tristan, I believe you're being nasty to me. That's, well, I suppose you have grace because it's your birthday tomorrow, so I can't even say anything. That is the rule in our household. You get 24 hours the day before, 24 hours after on your birthday, and nobody's allowed to say a bad thing. So, as much as it kills me, I'm going to only be able to say nice things about Tristan today, tomorrow, and the next day. And I bet he's jumping for joy for that. So, Tristan, it's so good, and I really hope you enjoy your 40th birthday tomorrow. <laughs> Just joking. Tristan's not turning 40. Tristan, how old are you even turning? I don't even know how old Tristan is turning. 30-something. He's in his early 30s. Shall we try and age Tristan? Tristan is turning... How old do you think, Ja? I was going to say 31, Megan. You didn't give me a chance. Megan gave me the answer before I even got a chance to guess. And I was looking at him. I was going to say, try and work out his identifying features, how many gray hairs he's got in his beard or in his hair, you know, all these different types of things. Does he have tatty ears? You know, <laughs> just joking. Of course, this is how we identify animals, not by how many gray hairs they have in their beard, because that doesn't matter at all. Now, we are on a treacherous road at the moment uh, on the escarpment. Oh, Tristan's now having a go at me because he says that I didn't wear a party hat. Now, I have to tell you that Tristan actually set me up. He d purposely didn't tell me that we were supposed to wear party hats this afternoon. And now I look bad. How terrible is that? But because it's his birthday tomorrow, he thinks that he can just get away with things like this, which is which is ridiculous. I think it's actually it's outrageous. I'm flabbergasted by his behaviour. Megan, you have to tell him that I'm flabbergasted. Little little joke there. But um, um but yes, but Tristan, 
I hope you have the best birthday ever tomorrow. And Scott, you're back at camp already, maybe making pizzas in the pouring rain. I don't know how that's going to work. But anyway, we'll see how it goes. I suppose Scott, he always makes plans. So I hope he's having the best birthday ever. I'm sure he is. It's always fun when you're with your family. And I suppose we're, we count as family, don't we? But we're going to try and drive now because I really, really want to get home before the train gets any harder because it's a nightmare already. I've, I've had to drive like this because I've got no windscreen wipers. I'm creeping along in low range like this. I feel like I'm Brent now. Doesn't Brent drive like this? Mm. Also, he can't defend himself. Okay, I'm actually scared. I need to concentrate over here going around the bend and keep both eyes on the road and both hands on the steering wheel. Tristan is also just driving around, but I think he's having it a lot easier than I am. Well, I don't know, Taylor. I'm driving around in a hat that isn't made to be worn that keeps flying off my head. And I feel like these excuses that are being made are just excuses between Taylor and possibly Louise. There's somebody's going to be in trouble because either one didn't tell the other one or Taylor just didn't want to participate. And so it's meant that I've had to wear three different head outfits this afternoon. So I've had to wear mine, Taylor's, and Scotty's to make up for it and so now I've got all three on and I suppose Noel's too what's what else can I add I've got well I do have I've got one cap two three and four so I've got for all four of the other well three of the other presenters and myself so I've covered you all guys and hopefully tomorrow you guys can make fun of yourselves and not just me because I've been left on my own today to have a good giggle and at least laugh and hopefully it's been at least entertaining I quite like my headdress I think it's a fair party hat and I would imagine if I went to a party in this lots of people would be quite entertained by it and ask lots of questions which would be perfect for a party mood it would be very festive if I went somewhere with my hat what do you think Senzo? yeah, yeah Senzo agrees Senzo says I'll be the life of the party and I believe Ali who's in FC tonight is rolling her eyes at me saying whatever hopefully no couch time for me it's my birthday tomorrow so I can't be put on the couch if that's the case or could I? Hopefully not. That will be a, a horrible way to spend the, my birthdays on the couch. <laughs> Let's not tempt fate. If Ali's an FC, I'm not going to tempt fate at all because no doubt she will follow through if I say the wrong thing and be, get myself into trouble. No, I'm just kidding. Ali doesn't actually put me on the couch at all. She's very tolerant of my nonsense and make no mistake that I am a handful to deal with at the best of time. So she does a lot of good things and keeps me in line, that's for sure. And she doesn't ever put me on the couch. This is all just a joke. Of course, she makes sure that I'm well looked after most of the time. Right. Now that twin dams, because I was hoping by some miracle all of these leopards that decided to have a party on Little Gauri today would have come this way because not one of them has been found this afternoon from this morning. So four different leopards, not one has been found. Oop, we have a malfunction of the party wear. And so I was hoping that I might just get a little bit of luck and one would be drinking at the dam. But alas, no sign unfortunately. Oh no, it's fallen over. What's going on, Pat? You've got to balance. I'm going to have to try and push it down. There we go. That's better. Should hopefully hold like that. It should hopefully be a lot better. <sighs> what a beautiful evening, though. It's got no clouds in the sky. It's absolutely the perfect temperature. I think it's probably some, one of the nicest evenings we've had in quite some time. It really is beautiful weather. There we go. 84 and 29. Not a cloud in the sky balmy evening absolutely perfect so what a wonderful way to kind of finish off our day and to drive in this is always very pleasant hopefully some of the animals will pop out and maybe we'll just get a last minute leopard I know we've had a leopard from Juma today but I feel like a last minute leopard of my own and so I'm going to hope for that and while we do that let's go across to Noel and see maybe she'll pull out a last minute leopard of her own or that aardvark that she was talking about And sadly, no art park. Leopard, I, I'm leopard. Tristan, I hope you find your last minute leopard. I don't know what's going on with me today. And then, uh, Niali, you were wondering. It's been my most exciting game drive ever. And I'm sitting here pondering. So, Jandre, game drive with Jandre was excellent. And my first game drive with you guys, super exciting. But if we had to take this one out of it, 
Um, I would actually say it was a walk. And the reason why I think of this just now is I actually had to write a short little uh, blurb about it today. I was working in the uh, Northwest province in South Africa, we are provinces similar to states. And I had guests that were there on an educational, one of the lodges I used to freelance at, and they desperately wanted to see lions. So we go out, it's in the morning, it's a little bit chilly, a little bit cold. So we're heading out, and one of the vehicles that headed out just before us got these three young male lions who were some of my favorite male lions to view. And after getting there, they went into a non-off-roading area, so we can't take the, the vehicle in. So all the other vehicles left, and um, we let them leave and then we stopped the vehicle we got off and we started tracking these lions on foot and as we're busy tracking these lions on foot i can hear another male roaring so we stop and we listen but he's about two kilometers away it was the father of these three males and as his roar dies down we just start to see these three young males we creep up a little bit closer probably about 60 meters from them and we had the sun behind us and the wind was blowing our scent away so they're not going to turn around and stare into the sun and also their father's calling from the opposite side so they're going to focus on there and as we get into perfect position optimal weather they start roaring and when a lion roars when you're on foot and you're about 60 meters and it's not just one lion it's three lions roaring all together your whole body shakes and we managed to sit there for about 20 minutes and um, before I decided look we've had a really good view you must carry on and I have to say that was one of the most exciting experiences that I can think of right at this moment to have on on a game viewing activity um, and 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 specifically on foot it was really 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 something special great question thank you okay last little bits of color showing to the west talked about our pastel skies earlier all right we're gonna head back over to Tristan I'm hoping he found his last minute leopard and I hope it's a real leopard and not a leopard branch Tristan enjoy good luck Unfortunately, no last minute leopards, many leopard logs that we've seen, but maybe you never know, maybe something will pop out in front of us in this area. Now, Phil, you want to know what my favorite birthday meal is in the bush? Hmm, I'm not really sure, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of a good steak, so a couple steaks on a fire with a whole bunch of friends under the stars of the bush, well, I don't think much can really beat that. One or two apple juices, of course, just to make sure that no one gets dehydrated. You wouldn't want a situation where anybody gets dehydrated while trying to slave over a hot fire. So that's kind of the plan. Now, we don't have too much time because it's almost the end of the show, but I need to get through this little dip because it's not going to have the best signal. So hopefully we can just get on top of this side, but it has been a wonderful Wonderful afternoon filled with all kinds of interesting things. It's great to have Noel on board but into the team and she started off with an absolute bang and for Jandre as well. I spoke to Jandre briefly before he went out and drive and said he had missed the leopard. So super happy for both of them that they got to catch up with Mvula. It's such a special thing to see and I'm really glad. Now it's also from Scotty who's had some car issues. Taylor, myself, Noel, Megs in FC and all the cam ops. It's been an absolute pleasure and we'll see you tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari.